For all in attendance, today's meeting is live streamed and will be available as a video. Noting the presence of a quorum, so glad everyone's here today, um, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Before we proceed with the rest of the agenda, there is one procedural matter that we must attend to. In the absence of a chair of the commission, the bylaws require the commission to elect a member to perform the functions of the chairman at the start of each meeting, with the understanding that the vice chairman is the likely person to be elected. So the commission must nominate and vote on who should run the June open session. Would someone like to make a motion? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, what is the motion? The motion is that you run the meeting. <laughs> thank you. I just. I was to be... trying to take it the shortcut. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm insecure, so I need to, uh, uh, So the, mo the motion's been seconded. Uh, all please signify approval by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, fellow commissioners. Um, okay. <coughs> Agenda item two is the report of the vice chairman. So two things on my report today. Uh, the first, the commission took a notational vote on our comments for the concept design of the Eastern Mar Market Metro Park submitted by the D.C. Department of General Services last month. This was approved unanimously with two abstentions on May 7th. Uh, also today, uh, several of us were had the great pleasure of a wonderful tour of the Georgetown section of the CNO Canal. That's going to be obviously an important part of today's open session agenda. We really appreciate the hospitality of the National Park Service and the informative um, tour, the Georgetown Heritage uh, Foundation also were really uh, tremendously valuable in helping us understand the vast undertaking that is envisioned here. So uh, we look forward to uh, hearing more about that in the open session today. Okay, agenda item three is a report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Uh, we're pleased to welcome three summer interns who have recently joined the commission, so I'll take this moment to introduce them. Uh, we, first, we have Adam Gordon. Adam? Uh, he's joined the Office of Public Engagement. Adam is a junior at Harvard University where he's pursuing a Bachelor's of Art in Architectural Studies and Germanic Language and Literature. Uh, next, we have Alex Baylor. Alex is a graduate student at the University of Maryland where he is working on his Master of Community Planning. Alex is working in our Physical Planning Division on the Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative. And finally, we have Audrey Wilkes. Audrey is a senior at the University of Maryland where she is working towards completing her Bachelor of Landscape Architecture. Audrey is also assigned to the Monumental Core Streetscapes Project in our Physical Planning Division. So welcome to all of you. Uh, you do have a written report in front of you, so that concludes my presentation for today. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Mr. Costa. I'd like to certainly acknowledge the two Terps in the room, uh, fellow <laughs> Terps. Uh, glad, glad the representation is here. Um, but this is going to be an exciting summer. We've got a huge agenda at the Commission, and I think you're going to learn a lot. It's going to inform your careers in a wonderful way, so welcome. Uh, agenda, item, agenda item four is a legislative up, update by Ms. Schuyler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Term, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, I do have something to report. I want to advise you re about House of Representatives Bill 2420 and Senate Bill 1267, both known as the National Museum of the American Latino Act. Um, it was introduced in the House and it's been referred to the respective committees. Uh, the text of the two bills are nearly identical and specify the following terms. They establish within the Smithsonian Institute the National Museum of the American Latino. They create a board of trustees to work with the Smithsonian Institute board, Institution Board of Regents to plan, construct, and manage the museum. It requires the Board of Regents to designate a site within two years of enactment of the Act from among the following four options. And these are very specific sites, and the selection has to be made as only between one of these four. The first is the Arts and Industry Building. Uh, 
The <coughs> second is a site under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service, bounded by 14th Street Northwest, Jefferson Drive Northwest, Raul Wallenberg Place Southwest, and Independence Avenue Southwest. The third is a site under the jurisdiction of the Ap architect of the Capitol, bounded by 3rd Street Northwest, Constitution Avenue Northwest, um, 1st Street Northwest, and Pennsylvania Northwest. And the final, which I have to profess while trying to figure this out in a map, is a little unclear, but it's a site under the jurisdiction of the Department of Agriculture <coughs> on the National Mall, bounded by 12th Street Northwest and 14th Street Northwest, and Jefferson Drive and Independence Avenue Southwest. So once a site is selected, the entity with jurisdiction over the selected site must transfer jurisdiction as soon as possible. The museum is not subject to the requirements of the Commemorative Work Act, but the Board of Regents must confer with NCPC and CFA, among others. The Act specifies that the size of the museum shall be not less than that identified in a report prepared by a commission formed to study the creation of the museum under a prior law. And finally, the Act authorizes users appropriated funds at a level of 50 percent to include a $20 million um, authorization in the Act for 2020, and 50 percent of the remaining funds will come from private sources. Thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to learning more about how that plays out. Thank you. Okay, agenda item five is the consent calendar. There are seven uh, consent calendar items on this month's agenda, items 5A through 5G. The first is for a tennis pavilion at the White House complex submitted by the National Park Service. The second is for an antenna at Building 52 at the United States Naval Observatory submitted by the Department of the Navy. The third is for the <coughs> entrance alterations at Building 10, the Naval, Naval Support Activity Bethesda, as submitted also by the Department of the Navy. The fourth is for the firing range facility expansion at Joint Base Andrews, also submitted by the Department of the Navy. The fifth item is for an antenna installation at the U.S. Department of Agriculture South Building, submitted by the General Services Administration. The sixth item is for approval of preliminary and final building plans for the Whittle School improvements at 3700 Tilden Street. And the final item is for a photovoltaic facility and boiler conversion at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Cheltenham, Maryland, submitted by the Department of Homeland Security. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. It's been moved. Second. Seconded. All in favor of uh, moving on the consent calendar, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That motion carried unanimously. Okay. We have a very full open session agenda today, so we'll jump right in. Um, we now start with agenda item 6A to provide comments on the concept plans for the Georgetown Canal Plan which addresses the first mile of the CNO Canal National Historic Park. Several commissioners, as I mentioned earlier, had the opportunity today to see this area and like to again thank the National Park Service for hosting this informative field trip. Ms. Dowker, Dowker please help us see it through. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, members of the commission. The National Park Service, in cooperation with the Georgetown BID, Georgetown Heritage, and the District Office of Planning has submitted concept plans for the Georgetown Canal for your review and comment. The project is located at the first one mile segment of the CNO Canal, which runs 184 and a half miles in total length from Washington, D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland. While much of the canal is in rural settings, the first mile is in an urban condition. The project is within the Georgetown Historic District and includes the canal segment between the zero mile marker to the east near the Thompson Boat Center all the way to the Alexandria Aqueduct to the west near the Key Bridge. The canal was engineered by James Geddes and Nathan Roberts and was constructed between 1828 and 1831. The canal had an industrial and transportation use. Uh, canal boats shipped goods and raw materials between the Potomac River and Allegheny Mountains. 
President Eisenhower proclaimed the CNO Canal a national monument in 1961. The canal was dedicated a National Historical Park in 1971 and was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. The applicant and landscape architect, James Corner Field Operations, have inventoried the canal's spatial configurations, materials, and characters, including open vistas and views to the Potomac, intimate enclosures focused on the canal or pocket parks, historic fabric and material, and areas with industrial or garden-like character. In 2018, the National Park Service completed a cultural landscape inventory, which documents the elements that contribute to the canal's historic integrity and character, as you can see on this map. The National Park Service identified project goals, which include improving safety, ABAAS compliant access, which I'll refer to as universal access, connections to the Georgetown community, and improvements to the visitor and educational experience. Today's presentation is organized around elements of the concept plan, including improvements to the towpath, access to the towpath, and interventions at seven locations. So first, the towpath. It is a pedestrian path of varying width between two to 10 feet wide, which runs parallel to the canal. The towpath retains historic integrity of location on the north side or the berm side of the canal between 29th and 34th streets. The towpath runs continuously on the north side of the canal and is discontinuous on the south of the canal. Three types of bridges connect the north and si uh, south sides of the canal and towpath. Bridges on the western end of the site connect the north and south pedestrian towpaths. Bridges near the center of the site connect between elevated buildings or plazas, which are above the towpath level, and bridges on the eastern end of the site provide vehicle connections with road level pedestrian crossings for towpath users. These photos from the western end of the site show the three historic bridge crossings that connect the north and south towpaths. To assess needed improvements, the applicant analyzed the varying widths of the towpath and that's referring to the, the gravel path shown on the image in the lower right. The red areas in the diagram indicate where the towpath is less than four feet wide, and this generally occurs on the north side of the canal west of Potomac Street. The applicant also studied the total available width, so that's the space between the canal edge and the retaining walls, where the towpath could be widened through leveling and removing of vegetation. This diagram shows that much of the available space along the canal is between 6 and 10 feet wide. And it is staff's understanding that for accessible circulation, the towpath needs to be at least 8 or 9 feet wide. Therefore, this diagram shows pinch points where the towpath is less than 8 feet wide. And the applicant is exploring options to widen the towpath at these points, which are mostly on the north side. <coughs> Today, the towpath has an informal character consisting of a gravel path lined with grass and vegetation at the top of the canal prism. The canal prism refers to the open channel that forms the canal waterway, and the uh, canal prism wall is, is right here. The photographs illustrate that today's towpath conditions reflect what existed a century ago. The, di the drawing shows that the existing towpath um, at narrow pinch points where the gravel path is only two to four feet wide. And staff notes that this condition poses challenges for people with limited mobility, but recommends that the applicant consider preserving the existing towpath character, especially in areas where the towpath does not need to be universally accessible. Because of the canal's historic integrity and status as a national monument, historical park, and its listing on the National Register of Historic Places, it is important to weigh needed improvements and programmatic changes against impacts to this historic resource. So in addition to the no action alternative, the applicant is presenting two alternatives, option A, which is generally minimal change, and option B, which is generally more significant change. The Commission's comments on the options presented today will inform what is included in the Environmental Assessment and Assessment of Effects Report. The Park Service is proposing changes to the existing towpath to meet universal accessibility standards while also considering that the towpath will be shared with guided mules leading interpretive canal boats. 
These boat tours were popular in the 1980s, and the Georgetown Heritage has been working to reinstate them. The applicant proposes two options for improving the towpath. Option A levels the walking surface, removes vegetation, and applies a curb edge within the available space. Option B is similar to option A, but also cantilevers the towpath over the canal prism wall to achieve a minimum width of eight to nine feet to meet accessibility requirements and provide circulation for guided mules. Staff anticipates this treatment would occur at the narrow pinch points shown earlier. Um, to avoid changing the character of the canal's open waterway, staff recommends that the applicant consider applying option B only in limited locations, so not for long stretches along the canal, and using option B to function as a lay-by, perhaps located under bridges where this is less visible. Staff finds that there is a way to provide universal access while maintaining the historic integrity of the site and recommends the applicant consider uh, identifying an accessible route through the historical park, if possible, alternating between the north and south towpaths. So for example, running along the north side here, switching over to the south side here where the towpath is wider, and applying a mixture of towpath options A and B. A preliminary review staff requests diagrams showing the proposed circulation for pedestrians, bicycles, guided mules, and universal access, and the details of the hybrid approach to the towpath showing where towpath options A and B would be applied, as well as the proposed materials and dimensions. Next, I'll discuss access to the towpath. Um, the canal's towpath is generally confined between buildings and retaining walls, which result in challenging grade changes and connections from streets, bridges, and plazas down to the uh, towpath level. The towpath and the bridges that cross the canal are accessed by a, a series of stair and ramp connections indicated here in yellow and blue. Staff finds that elevators are needed for universal accessibility and supports the proposed elevators and ramps, which would make the pedestrian bridges universally accessible and staff requests additional information regarding the elevator proposed at the western end of the site near the key bridge, which is over here. Next, I'll discuss the interventions at seven locations where site and landscape improvements are proposed. For clarity, I'll present these from east to west. Um, these include the mile marker zero, the Rock Creek Confluence, the Locks, the Wisconsin Avenue Cutout, the Market Plaza, Stone Yard, and Aqueduct and I'll walk through each location and discuss the proposed options A and B. So first, the mile marker zero. Staff notes that this currently underutilized area contains the zero mile marker for the entire 184 and a half mile CNO Canal Trail. Photos of the site show its current condition. It is difficult to see and access as it's located on the southern end of the peninsula and hidden behind existing boat storage. Staff notes that contributing resources here include the waste gate ruins, the tide lock, the mole, which refers to the earthen peninsula, and the Rock Creek Basin. Option A retains the existing boat storage, proposes a new bridge, improvements to the tide lock, including the Potomac terraces, which step down to the water. Option B relocates the boat storage to the Thompson Boat Center parking area, proposes a new bridge, landscaping, and river terraces. Staff finds that the mile marker zero area can support more significant change as shown in option B, and this has less potential to impact historic character. An additional element of option B is a pedestrian and bicycle bridge. This plan shows the proposed K Street Bridge, <coughs> which is indicated here at uh, number four. The boat storage uh, relocated to the parking area here and here, indicated in number three. The existing vehicle and pedestrian bridge to Thompson Boat Center here, and the proposed bridge to mile marker zero near number one here. Staff finds that the addition of the K Street Bridge enhances bicycle connections between the K Street Cycle Track and Rock Creek Park Trail and buffers pedestrians from the parkway traffic. Next, we have the Rock Creek Confluence. This area jo joins the Georgetown level of the canal with Rock Creek. 
Staff notes that contributing resources here include the Rock Creek Basin, the Canal Prism, the Towpath, Lock One, Boat Basin One, and the 29th Street Bridge. This location only has one option, option A, which proposes a bridge over the confluence connecting to private lands to form a trail connection all along the western bank of Rock Creek and puts pe uh, pedestrians away from parkway traffic. Staff finds that the confluence area can support minimal change as shown in option A. Then we have the locks. This area is the location of the National Park Service CNO Canal Visitor Center. The locks and canal walls were recently restored here, and this will be the place where interpretive mule-led canal boats will be ticketed with passengers and depart westward along the canal. Staff notes that contributing resources here include the towpath, lock three, boat basins two and three, the 30th Street Bridge, the Thomas uh, Jefferson Street Bridge, and lock four. Option A proposes rehabilitating the existing visitor and education center, enhancing the mule yard lawn and tree groves, <laughs> incorporating an interactive lock model, and improving the canal boat waiting area. Option B proposes a new visitors uh, and education center to the north of the site, which is located up here, enhancing the mule yard and lawn and tree groves, incorporating an interactive lock model, and improving the canal boat waiting area, which would be co-located with the mule staging. Staff finds that, the, that this area can support more significant change, as shown in option B, to meet uh, park service, visitor and education center space and program needs. Next, we have the Wisconsin Avenue cutout. Staff notes there is a large grade separation between Wisconsin Avenue and the canal towpath at this location. Here, the canal is tightly framed by retaining walls, and the towpath only occurs on the north side. Staff notes the contributing resources here include the towpath, the canal prism, the water intake, the Wisconsin Avenue bridge, the commemorative obelisk, and the north retaining walls. Option A proposes an elevator at the current location of the obelisk, an expanded linear staircase and stone archway and seating steps. Staff recommends that the applicant consider relocating the elevator to a less visible location that does not impact the historic location of the commemorative obelisk. Option B proposes an elevator further set back from the street, a compressed stairway, the stone archway and seating steps, and a boardwalk along the southern side of the canal, which you can see here. Staff finds that this area can only support minimal change, as was shown in option A, as it has more potential to impact historic character. Staff finds that the stone archway and seating steps do not create a welcoming space for pedestrians to linger and recommends the applicant evaluate the usage and need for the stone archway and seating steps and consider options without these elements while still providing ample circulation for elevator and stair egress. Next, we have the market plazas. The market plaza area is a spatially constrained section of the canal tightly framed by buildings that are three to eight stories tall. The Market House Plaza is to the north. Uh, we were here this morning. Um, so here you see the retaining wall and the small plaza overlooking the canal. And the Fish Market Square is to the south. You see it here with the water intake. These plazas provide open areas for gatherings and activities. Staff notes that contributing resources here include the towpath, the canal prism, the Potomac Street Bridge, the water intake ruins, and the north retaining walls. Both options A and B include an elevator for universal access to the towpath. Staff supports the location for the proposed elevator at the Market House Plaza adjacent to the Georgetown Park building turret. Staff finds that options A and B for the Market Plaza area have strengths and weaknesses. Option A includes an elevated sky deck for viewing the canal and fish market grove and gongoozling platform. Uh, I'll just note that a gongoozler is a British term for someone who enjoys watching canal activity. And that's we, okay. we were that today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Staff finds that option A protects the historic uh, character, particularly the north retaining wall framing the canal, and maintains a level plaza area for outdoor programming and events. 
However, it does not provide a strong north-south visual and spatial connection between the two plazas. Option B includes terrace seating at the Market House Plaza on the north side and an open air canopy within the Fish Market Square on the south side. Staff finds that option B provides a north-south visual and spatial connection between the two plazas as well as additional seating space for pedestrians. However, it has more potential to impact historic character, particularly the north retaining wall which frames the canal. Option B also impacts the circulation and service access on Potomac Street, which provides entrance to adjacent buildings and businesses. Therefore, staff requests additional documentation, including the feasibility and practicality of constructing Option B's terrace seating and related improvements, including how one would access uh, the Georgetown Market House and surrounding buildings and regrading along Potomac Street if necessary. Um, additionally, staff requests information on how visitors will use and experience the spaces and options A and B and visualizations for the proposed designs. Regarding Fish Market Square, which is the plaza area to the south, staff finds that the proposed open air canopy overwhelms the intimate space that exists there today and recommends the use of temporary canopy structures when needed. Next we have the Stone Yard. The stone yard has a wide towpath and adjacent vegetated open space south of the canal. Staff notes that contributing resources here include the towpath, the canal prism, the 34th Street Bridge, the dual water intake, and the north retaining wall. Option A proposes a kayak boat launch and seating area south of the towpath, which you see here in number two. Option B proposes a combined seating and boat launch area and staff finds that this area can support minimal change as was shown in option A and recommends that the applicant consider relocating the kayak boat launch from this area, the stone yard, uh, westward to the aqueduct to avoid potential conflicts between the floating dock and its associated recreational programming and the interpretive mule drawn boats. Lastly, we have the aqueduct. The aqueduct begins a transition from the canal's urban condition on the east to a more naturalized condition on the west, which is more typical of the majority of the CNO Canal Trail. There are several contributing resources at the aqueduct, including the towpath, canal prism, the Alexandria Aqueduct abutments, and the Washington Canoe Club. Both options A and B propose improved connections between the towpath, which is up here at a higher elevation, and the Capitol Crescent Trail, which is down here at a lower elevation. Option A includes a meadow and boardwalk between the abutments with a platform overlooking the Potomac River. Option B proposes a trestle pavilion mimicking the former historic structure and planted terraces overlooking the Potomac River. Option B also includes a recreational kiosk and boat launch. Staff finds that this area can support minimal change as was shown in option A and has more potential to impact historic character. So to summarize, we're seeking to balance improved visitor experience and universal accessibility with historic preservation. Therefore, it is the executive director's recommendation that the commission supports the National Park Service Park Service's goals for improving the canal while also maintaining its unique historic character, supports goals for making the existing towpath more accessible, recommends that the applicant consider a hybrid approach to the towpath to maintain its character, and requests additional documentation on the, this hybrid approach, related circulation patterns, materials, and details of preliminary review supports the proposed elevators and ramps and requests additional information regarding the elevator proposed near the key bridge. And I've summarized these comments for each location during the presentation, which find that mile marker zero can accommodate option B, the Rock Creek confluence can support option A, the locks can accommodate option B, the Wisconsin Avenue cutout can support option A, but uh, recommend reevaluating the elevator location and stone archway and seating steps. The fish market plazas have strengths and weaknesses, and a request for additional documentation on the feasibility of constructing option B, how visitors will use and experience the spaces, and visualizations for these options. 
and finds that the stone yard and aqueduct can support option A and requests that the applicant provide further details as plans are further developed. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. We also have staff from the National Park Service and Georgetown Heritage here to answer questions as well. Wow, thank you for a very comprehensive presentation. There's a lot to take in, but it was great to see the space today and help envision some of the things that are being proposed. Any questions for Ms. Dowker before we go to our six registered speakers? <clears throat> okay, let's uh, first ask uh, Pat Tiller on behalf of the community of Committee of 100 on the Federal City to uh, provide your five minutes of remarks, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon. My name is Dutil Patterson Tiller. I also go by Pat Tiller. Um, representing the Committee of 100 on the uh, Federal City, the district's oldest uh, planning advocacy nonprofit, and we'll be celebrating our 100th anniversary very soon. Uh, before joining the Committee of 100, I proudly served for 30 years with the U.S. National Park Service um, out west, and the last 10 years here in Washington as the agency's associate director and deputy associate director for cultural resources. With that happy uh, personal connection to America's most beloved federal agency. I'm kind of saddened to come before you today critical of my alma mater. Um, the committee applauds uh, the goal of rehabilitating, restoring, and increasing public access and enjoyment on this one-mile segment of the canal. But the historic integrity must not be subordinated to recreational, economic, and tourism interests, as we fear many aspects of this plan do. The conceptual touchstone of this plan appears to be the wildly popular and successful High Line in New York City on the uh, Lower West Side. It's wonderful. Everybody agrees. I've walked it three times. It's, it's, it's one of the great wonders of, uh, of uh, this era. But unlike the High Line, we argue, the CNO Canal is a different kettle of fish. It's not obsolete, does not require rescuing, nor repurposing. And it requires a higher level of care than currently proposed, we argue, in the concept plan. <clears throat> Moreover, while the, his, while the High Line is historic, it is at best locally significant. It's a locally significant historic property. The CNO Canal, all 184.5 miles of it, is a nationally significant treasure. President Eisenhower, as you heard, declared it a national monument. It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And finally, it is a unit of the great U.S. National Park System, and more respectful tactics, we argue, are mandatory. The CNO Canal neither needs repurposing nor reimagining has been offered uh, as the let motif for driving concept of this uh, plan. The Georgetown Canal segment does not need to be jazzed up. It does not need to be highlined. Um, not appropriate are the, uh, the, the wide-scale use of landscapes, perennials, tree groves, all while pretty, all while wonderful, everybody will love them, are not appropriate for the historic canal, whose historic nature was and continues largely gritty and industrial. Historically, the canal was neither a garden nor a local recreational park. The aqueduct ruin is neither a wildflower garden nor the setting for an ersatz historic bridge trust. The wholesale introduction of recreational floating boardwalks, conversation pits, and hammocks, we believe, are inadvisable. They, no doubt, again, will be wildly popular. These choices are incompatible National Park Service policies and incompatible in material design and historic character with the canal, particularly at mile marker zero. No better example of this tension exists than the proposal to reimagine the historic towpath. The plan considers paving, widening, even cantilevering it out over the canal in ways that never existed historically. Remembering again, this is a nationally historic property. All this is to provide wide berth for jogging and uh, walking. The towpath is an historically emblematic element of the canal, as much so as the locks, the water, sidewalls. Looking at 19th century photographs, as you saw, the towpath today is largely unchanged from its historic period. The recent National Park Service Cultural Landscape Inventory by Elder and Weldon is a remarkable document, and the Park Service accepted it. The superintendent for the canal signed off on it. In it, it is the, the towpath is uh, described as nationally significant and recommends no change whatsoever as the preferred treatment. Why is this not being followed in this plan? 
The Georgetown segment of the CNO Canal is not a local park. It's not a playground. It's not a park horse. It's not a gym. The park's primary charge is not recreational, particularly at the expense of historic integrity. The park's primary purpose is to preserve, instruct, interpret, tell the story of this remarkably, uh, remarkable nationally significant chapter in Americans' industrial heritage. This is hard to view when peeking through herbaceous perennial borders, floating docks, hmm. and, and, um, and hammocks. Importantly, federal law, regulation, the National Park Service administrative procedures and management policies are clear here. Important citations include the Secretary of Interior Standards for Archaeology and Historic Preservation, NPS, 40, uh, NPS 28, NPS Management Policies, and, policies, and significantly Section 110F of the National Historic Preservation Act. Of course, recreation, enjoyment, access, interpretation are legitimate functions and responsibilities of the National Park Service. We don't argue with that. But to the degree the historic can, uh, but to the degree that the historic integrity of the canal is, canal is not um, compromised, we, which we believe many of these proposals are, a better balance needs to be struck with the canal concept plan. The Committee of 100 believes, regrettably, the National Park Service has lost its way, excessively deferring to economic and tourism interests. In fact, many people in Washington now call the project the Disneyfication of the CNO Canal. We would not tolerate a wet and wild water slide in the tidal basin, nor would we a cantilevered Starbucks on the escarpment over, Grand, uh, over uh, Great Falls. Some aspects of the concept plan are terrific. Some are, I think, equally inappropriate. We need to reimagine, I think, the plan. Thank you for your attention. Please take the time to get it right. Um, the byword, I think, needs to be take it easy, get it right. Right now, we don't believe it is in that state. The canal is too important an historic treasure for my hometown to be treated inappropriately. Future generations are depending on you all and all of us to make sure that happens. The Committee of 100 on the Federal City appreciates this opportunity to speak to you today on the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Tiller, for expressing clearly your point of view for the Committee of 100. Um, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Rick Murphy from ANC 2E05. Mr. Murphy here. OK. Thank you. Well, next is uh, Ms. Allison Steele. Ms. Steele, you will have three minutes to provide your testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here this afternoon. I'm Allison Seal, an architect at Foggy Bottom. I have worked within walking distance of the canal for over 20 years, and I'm here in support of the concept plan. Uh, the Georgetown Town Canal Plan brings much-needed revitalization to the first mile of this unique National Historical Park. Along with material and structural repairs, the proposed accessibility, wayfinding, and interpretive improvements are essential to fulfilling the next step in this urban landscape's evolution. The canal, and particularly this section passing through Georgetown, has always been a busy and changing landscape. Even before the canal was constructed, the Georgetown waterfront was the setting for a busy tobacco port, a lumber yard, cement works, and of course the Washington flour mill. The canal's construction brought another layer of activity. At one time in the 1870s, over 500 craft were on the canal at once. Since 1971, the park's purpose has continued to be active to preserve and help visitors discover the history, nature, and recreational opportunities of the place but physical deterioration has hindered this over time. The proposed concept plan establishes a positive vision for the Georgetown section of the canal with its attention to authenticity, access, and interpretation. Authenticity is very important, as we've heard, right? The plan represents major, major investments in maintaining and repairing the canal's historic fabric. The extensive work is critical for the structures to welcome and safely serve visitors for this generation and the next. Care is being taken to retain character giving features such as the stone walls, their alignments, and the scale and industrial nature of this place. As importantly, proposed new elements are designed to be clearly of our time 
and the temptation to create a false sense of historicity is re, uh, resisted. Secondly, accessibility. The plan corrects major deficiencies in accessibility for persons with mobility issues along the main areas of the park. Nearly 30 years after the American with Disabilities Act came into law, um, it's time to remove the barriers and safety hazards of steep grades, cross slopes of pathways, and uneven ground. It should not be too much to ask that a veteran or multi-generational family group be able to enjoy a stroll at this national park in our nation's capital. And finally, interpretation. Places for storytelling, for learning, and small gatherings are needed to provide opportunities to learn about the canal, its history, and its ecology. These are scaled proportionally with the spatial character of the canal itself and provide variety, adaptability, and opportunities for pausing and learning that are essential components of meaningful engagement, which is the foundation for any preservation action. The Georgetown section of the CNL Canal is an exceptional and unique urban park that presents wide-ranging needs and opportunities. The concept plan developed by this project leadership team of the National Park Service, Georgetown Heritage, the DC Office of Planning, and the BID addresses them appropriately and coherently, which is amazing considering, um, <laughs> in such a way to encourage the sense of life and discovery that has always been part of the canal's identity. That's no small feat, and I ask you to support them. Thank you, Ms. Steele. The next speaker is Adam Metz, the Georgetown Heritage Board's Chair, and speaking on their behalf. Ms. Mr. Metz, you'll have five minutes to provide your testimony. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to start by thanking uh, NCPC for allowing me to speak on behalf of Georgetown Heritage. Uh, as you know, Georgetown Heritage is a official 501c3 nonprofit partner of both the CNO uh, Canal National Historic Park and a portion of the Rock Creek Park. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Adam Metz. I'm a resident of Georgetown, and I'm here representing Georgetown Heritage Board of Directors. I'm not the chairman of it, though. I'm actually chairman of the Infrastructure and Planning Committee we have. Of that board, I'm on our executive committee, and it's my pleasure to be here today with you. Um, you know, as people have discussed, the canal has a long and storied history. Uh, leading to the place we are today as part of the uh, national park system as a monument, historic monument. Um, unfortunately, uh, the National Park Service has a, I think as of 2016, a, a maintenance backlog of something in roughly the range of $12 billion, and the CNO Canal is no exception. Uh, we just completed a recent engineering report highlighting tens of millions of dollars of infrastructure improvements within this just one mile area. When you walked the canal earlier today, I hope you were impressed and awed by the beauty and engineering marvel of the space. At the same time, one can't but notice some crumbly canal walls and other areas in need of attention and care. Um, we created Georgetown Heritage for the express purpose of addressing these issues. As Allison mentioned, we formed a partnership among the National Park Service, Georgetown BID, the DC Office of Planning and Georgetown Heritage to address these needs and reimagine re uh, what the canal could be. In addition to the physical improvements, our goal is to create programming to share the history of the canal and to create a place to enjoy its incredible natural beauty with strong connection to the past in the city for the enjoyment of our local residents, the citizens of DC, as well as our many visitors. We anticipate this one mile stretch being an inviting center for social gatherings art, immersive learning, contemplation, and recreation. And let me just quote from the enabling legislation. Uh, the purpose of the park is, and here's where the quote starts, to preserve and interpret the 19th century transportation canal from Washington, D.C. to Cumberland, Maryland, and its associated scenic, natural, and cultural resources, and to provide opportunities for education and appropriate outdoor recreation. Um, as I, as I previously mentioned, the, the preliminary design plans presented today are the result of a four-way partnership um, with the entities we mentioned. We've also had a number of community meetings to solicit public input. input. This is a unique national park in that it's a narrow ribbon running through a densely populated section of the city. It's not a typical national park that has one or two entrances that can be closed at night. It's an integral part of the fabric of Georgetown. We're trying to balance uh, with our design, the mandate of the National Park, 
with the needs of an urban park surrounded by businesses and residents. By increasing activity, we expose this historic gem to more people, establish a new generation of park stewards, but also through increased activities, we can also help address some security concerns of the immediate neighbors. We're dedicated to highlighting its historic significance by preserving the canal's history and enlivening the park through programming. The programming has served as a cornerstone of the project and in many ways was the driving force of why we created Georgetown Heritage and began this effort to create a place where people could learn about, experience the history of the canal in Georgetown. I, I want to just hit a couple highlights on the history um, that would come out through the storytelling that we would have available here. Um, George Washington actually had a, a, a dream of connecting the Potomac and Ohio Valleys, which was uh, the, kind of the background for the canal. Uh, the canal rose in the mid-19th century, followed by a decline during the Civil War and a brief resurgence after. The story of America's railways, the catalyst leading to the canal's final decline by the 20th century. The story of the Civilian Conservation Corps restoring the canal under President Roosevelt in 1938. The story to fend off the transformation of the canal into a highway in the 50s, uh, led in, in many ways by Justice William O. Douglas. The story of generations of Americans who built, worked on, and preserved this place in its history. The story of the canal, in many ways, has changed and transformed uh, formed over time. Uh, it's not a static story. Um, we hope to bring these stories to life through programs and on the canal boat and also to help inform and inspire the design. So in conclusion, if the canal is to be preserved for future generations, we cannot resign ourselves to the current trajectory. We will be left with nothing but a relic of American history. Um, by bringing these groups together, we believe the only way to preserve this national historic park for future generations to come is to restore, honor, and elevate its significance through our collaborative efforts. Today, we have a historic opportunity to move forward to unlock the canal's potential and shape its next chapter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Metz. Um, the next speaker is Bob Peck with Gensler. Welcome, Mr. Peck. You'll have three minutes to provide your testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to emphasize I'm here as a, as a private citizen. I have served as a volunteer advisor to uh, Adams Infrastructure Committee on, on Georgetown Heritage. Um, but I have been, a, I am a former commissioner of the Public Building Service and I have been a GSA designee oh, yeah, to, the, uh, to NCPC in the, in the past. Um, I've also lived in this area my, uh, almost my entire life. Uh, and I have lived in the district continuously since 1973, and for a very long time, the canal towpath was part of my regular running route. Finally, I just say I've been involved in lots of projects in which um, there has been a partnership with the National Park Service. And I don't think I've seen one uh, in which the partnership has worked more more effectively. Um, what I'd like to emphasize is are some accessibility uh, issues, um, and to note that uh, it's a wonderful resource. It is, it is, in fact, a national park, but also an urban park. It needs to serve visitors to Washington. It needs to serve the historic Georgetown community. And there's an opportunity to do that while uh, emphasizing the mission that the park has of interpreting and reflecting on its industrial, uh, its industrial history. I'd like to note that the, uh, the director's order number 42 on accessibility, and let's just talk about um, the classic sense of accessibility for those who are uh, disabled, um, says that the NPS will seek to provide the highest level of accessibility reasonable, not simply the minimum level. And while, of course, that means that it has to be taken into, a, that um, historic uh, issues need to be taken into account, I'd also note that running down the towpath, walking down the towpath these, these days is a challenge. And, the, and going back and forth over the canal, uh, yes, is partly a historic condition, but I'd note that the original engineers uh, in, uh, intended that there be a 12-foot wide towpath all the way through Georgetown. Um, and that's something that I think we could consider uh, as part of uh, restoring it that would, would make it more accessible to, to citizens. Moreover, and I think as um, noted in the executive director's report, there are uh, some accessibility issues that are more ease that are less controversial probably just in dealing with access from the streets of Georgetown down to the canal towpath <coughs> itself. I guess I'd like mostly to just to uh, 
plead for the balance that is required to make this a resource that can be enjoyed. When I, when I have visitors, I always bring them to Georgetown, want them to see the towpath and the, uh, and the waterfront park. Uh, and it is particularly difficult to access. There is an opportunity here to balance history and interpretation with the best aspects of an urban park in our time. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Peck. Um, and the last speaker today is uh, Ms. Stephanie Bothwell, representing the Citizens Association of Georgetown. Welcome, Ms. Bothwell. You'll have five minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank, thank you and good afternoon. I come to you as a board member of CAG and um, the newest chair of a new committee called um, the Historic District. Um, CAG is pleased to review these proposals for the CNO Canal, which offer many interesting and innovative ideas. We would like to see the following core goals guide decisions on design to preserve and highlight the historic features of this unique place, to help visitors understand and interpret this history, to pre preserve green space and natural features, and to enhance the general beauty and accessibility of the area. The proposals support these goals in many ways, though in CAG's view, some elements could overpower the historic character, authenticity, and sense of place that the sponsors recognize need to be preserved. A simpler approach, as outlined below, would not only be more in keeping with the historic character of the area, but could also be cons considerably less expensive. The pinch point proposals. Alter um, alternative one proposes mm -hmm. maximizing towpath width along its length by regrading. Alternative two calls for widening of the towpath to eight or nine at the narrowest points with some sort of projecting structure. CAG believes that alternative one is the better choice as it would preserve the historic integrity of the path and the historic width of the canal. Natural materials should continue to be used on the towpath and a narrow band of grass and or mule kick, as it's proposed, could line the canal side of the path for safety and aesthetic reasons. Mile marker, um, zero proposals. Um, the proposal identifies five key places along the canal to do more major projects. The first is mile marker, zero, where Rock Creek empties into the Potomac. This is an already a lovely area and can be enhanced at relatively modest cost with landscaping and seating and perhaps with the proposed new pedestrian and bike bridges depending on cost. CAG would like to see the history of the canal emphasized here through historic markers, as in the waterfront park. Some of the more flashy proposals in options A and B, including nets, kiosks, and steps, do not seem necessary and threaten to diminish the historic integrity of this important site. The Rock Creek confluence next to the West Heating Plant, the proposal calls for stabilizing the creek edge and adding a pedestrian bridge, which CAG has long supported in this location. It also calls for a platform overlooking Lock 1, which is a nice embellishment. The locks. This is a good location to add features, as it is spacious and readily accessible and has fewer historic features. CAG supports either option A or B, though B may have more implications for traffic and parking given its larger education and visitor centers. Adding a path and ramp south of the canal between 29th and 30th Street would remove green space and depart from the historic uh, integrity of the site. We presume there would be public restrooms in the visitor center and they should be large enough to handle expected pedestrian traffic along the one mile length of the canal renovation. The market plazas west of Wisconsin Avenue. CAG prefers the more modest approach in option A to the more expansive one of option B. Option A improves access to the towpath and CAG agrees that this would be an appropriate place along the canal to install an elevator. The Gongosling platform uh, seems like a good addition on the south side of the canal, but we question the need for a water intake feature as the canal itself is the key water feature. 
The removal of significant parts of the stone wall for seating in both op options should be avoided as the wall is an important historic feature whose integrity should be preserved. Adding a new boardwalk and dock on the south side as proposed in option B also seems questionable as these features would squeeze the canal and would likely get only modest use. The open air modern canopy is not historically appropriate and more natural ways to provide shade through landscaping should be considered instead. And lastly, the aqueduct and stone yard CAG supports the idea of adding seating in the stone yard area but does not think the boat launch dock or platform option B needed to be needed. Accessibility to the area is limited and intrusions into the canal should be kept to a minimum. CAG generally likes the uh, proposal in option A for the aqueduct, including the path and landscape, though the cantilever overlook may not be needed. The kiosk and pavilion in option B are not appropriate for this quiet and contemplative spot. This does seem to be the best place along the canal for a boat launch deck dock. Um, providing seating and shade along the canal near the dock would be helpful but should be done in a natural manner as possible. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much to all of the members of the community who have expressed uh, opinions about this. It's quite extraordinary to see so much uh, collaboration and, and uh, community input on such an important topic. So I think now uh, I'd like to turn to the commission to open up for discussion on this expansive topic. Who wants to start? Mr. Trueblood. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say you know, the Office of Planning has been working with, with NCPC, with Georgetown Heritage, and the bid on this. And, and I think overall uh, I, I'm very impressed by the presentation and, and by the options. I will say for me personally, uh, the thing I'm most compelled by is um, uh, what Mr. Peck spoke about in terms of accessibility. I think, you know, those, it shouldn't be a privilege to be able to enjoy this national park. It should be a right. Um, and I think that that, um, uh, so I was, I was happy to see uh, the interventions there, uh, especially I'm interested in, in seeing what the, 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 I noticed the staff asked for a map of what the universally accessible path will look like, and so that is something I'm interested in. But as it gets to the actual, um, the path itself, I think widening it in order to maintain accessibility is something that would be valuable. Would that include any cantilevering uh, in, in some locations? So I, I think I agree. I, I like what the staff said, which is try to minimize it, but where it's necessary, especially under bridge crossings, as we, as we saw, those bridge crossings can be um, have low overhead and, 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 and tough paths, I think that makes, I think it would be important. Okay. Anyone else want to jump in? Commissioner Cash. So sorry I didn't stay for the, the whole tour today. It was pretty hot out there. But I want to agree with uh, <laughs> Mr. Trueblood. I mean, I think that, that accessibility is really important and there can be some improvements there. But um, I think one of the, the speakers said this is kind of like the high lining of Georgetown. I almost see this as the wharfing of Georgetown. Like if you want all that cool little interactive water stuff, you've got a great booming part of the city there. I think that maybe, and I don't think I say this often, I think maybe there's some over-programming here. I mean, there, there were the boat tours for years on this with the tow pass it, as they are. Maybe we could think about reprogramming it. We don't need the mules here. Go up to Great Falls if you want to take the mule ride and we can have some motorized boats. I think that trying to really scale back the amount of stuff that we're doing here is really important to, I think, balance with that historic character. I mean, even I'll also mention, I mean, there's the proposed kayaking and putting things into the canal. You're literally 100 yards away from the boathouse where you can boat on the Potomac. So I just want to be careful that we're not taking away from other assets and other great things in a water city like ours by trying to shove it all into this Georgetown historical site, which a lot of these others aren't. So I would just really advocate for as light of a touch as possible, but I think the accessibility is, is actually something that, that everyone would benefit from, from the current users to people that can't use it right now. So I just uh, uh, advocate for a very light touch. Commissioner Cash, would you exempt, uh, add a little more just on the, the boat launch notion uh, down at the aqueduct, whether you think that recommendation makes sense or do you have an opinion about that? Well, I mean, I just, I don't see that many people necessarily kayaking in a five-foot deep 
canal when you can kayak literally 100 yards away. And I can't remember, is it Thompson or Fletcher? What's the one over the Thompson about house, which is right there in the Potomac, and you can go and boat around and go to the island and all that stuff. And then you have the other boat launched down at the, the mile marker zero side. So I just feel like people, for having to put a big platform into the water, the use that it's going to get, I think it's a, it's a great idea if we were maybe up in Great Falls where there's a similar thing to this. But, I mean, there's plenty of other facilities for this stuff. And I think for dumping a big barge into the historic canal, it's, it might not get that much use and it might not actually be that necessary. It's nice of an experience of going literally 100 yards to the west and renting a kayak there, which is already a park service concessioner. So um, I would just, and I would just, yeah, I think that, that we don't want to be too duplicative here. Thank you very much. Commissioner Wright. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. No, you're going to be surprised. This is, a, it's just too much to kind of take in all at once. And it's too much to comment on all at once, for me anyway. But the, but the, um, <clears throat> I tend to agree with the Committee of 100, but not this time. Um, uh, because I think um, if the canal is not adapted to contemporary use and entombed, it will look like it looks today, which is pretty dreary. Um, I'm, I'm, I actually asked a question about trash because I was surprised at how little trash there was. Um, and I was quickly told that there's a great effort to clean, uh, to, to pick up the trash on a regular basis. Um, having said all that, um, it, it feels like too much. Um, um, it feels too clever in places by half. Um, um, and there's a difference between adaptively reusing and reinventing um, for, for a completely disparate use. And it, in, in parts, particularly the market spaces, feel, um, I, I didn't really have a feel for it because we started at the Dean and DeLuca site, but as I reflect on what we saw today, I don't know why we would try so hard um, to to um, change this um, too much. It's already got the bones in place, and it felt like maybe a little cosmetic surgery is in order, but not major medical. Um, and 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 it. So I would urge um, uh, uh, again throughout the entire program um, balance um, um, and not going too far to, to and, and making it, um, I, I guess that was an insult to, to call it the high lining of Georgetown, um, w which was kind of weird because I think the high line is a, is a hugely successful, wonderful place to visit, but it's one of a kind. And, and in a different way, the canal is one of a kind and should be allowed to be that. Um, it just, it feels like we, we, the balance could easily tip if we do too much intervention, regardless of, of choice of materials and, and, and plant selection and all that, it could lose its, um, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but it character comes to mind, but authenticity is a good one. I mean, I, I, I think it's the industrial story that it tells is really important to remember, and it's going to be really important 50 years from now to remember if, we're, if it's not underwater. Um, so, so I would just urge restraint, and I look forward to seeing it in, in digestible chunks. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a question, actually. Yes, Mr. That, and, and, sorry, just to... May, may I? Perfect. Okay. Um, and it's to really follow up on, on these uh, observations as well as uh, Mr. Tiller's uh, comment, which is it wasn't necessarily clear here where there might be vending or concessions or commercial activity. Um, so is, uh, is that a, even a part of this? Have they, has that been considered as, as part of this application about where those would be and what that would be? Um, 
well, I might actually defer to the Park Service on that. So that's a level of detail we haven't gotten into yet as far as commercial activity or vending. Um, we are really focused on, um, you know, what is the repair and rehabilitation that needs to happen as an underlying principle for the entire park, and then what interventions are appropriate to further the interpretation and education of the site. Sorry. <laughs> I'm uh, Tammy Sidham. I'm the Deputy Associate Regional Director for Lands and Planning for the National Park Service. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Wright. White. White. Pardon, pardon me. <laughs> we have right and, and white. Oh, I can't win. Just yeah, want to make sure for the, the record that it was <laughs> Commissioner White. Thank you. Um, I, I so appreciate the previous comments and agree with them all, and I love the word restraint. And I also liked what Mr. Peck had to say of pleading for balance, and I think that's what we're trying to achieve here. And in the parks and open space world, there's this big pick, big push for activation and programming. And every inch of public space needs to be programmed, that it can't just be enjoyed for being public space. And I think that's, um, I think I see that in this uh, concept plan. Although for most of uh, the plans that I see like this, this does show some restraint, but I think it does need to be pulled back even further, particularly around kayaking. Um, I totally agree. You can go a couple hundred feet away um, and, and kayak, but I also think from a, the historic integrity of the site and celebrating and enhancing the user experience, you want people to understand what that canal was about. So I wouldn't want to move the mules. I think that's what makes it really compelling when they're out and operating and people can see what a constrained space this is. Those historic photos are fantastic when you see the five boats tied up alongside. So I would advocate to keep the mules, get rid of the kayaks. Um, <laughs> the, it's a sound bite. The, um, the other thing about the space as it is, there's a certain beauty to it and there's a, you know, the decay of it is one thing, but you do need to make sure it's accessible and I think that is the key driver here to do the minimal intervention to make sure it is a right, not a privilege, to be able to get down there and appreciate that experience. And for someone who's temporarily um, mobility limited, it was challenging today to, to get down there. So I can't imagine if, if you couldn't do stairs what that would be like. Um, so I think that the, the other thing I want to say is I really commend the staff for the thoughtful and thorough review of this proposal and the level of detail and analysis of each of these options that we're looking at. I thought it was really well done, and I agree with everything that you recommend, particularly the areas where we need further focus. And getting out there today and seeing it makes me appreciate the analysis all the more. So I'm glad that we're looking at it at this stage, and I completely agree we've got to chunk it down. It's just too much to, to take in at once. So I'm, I'm glad we have some time to really think this through because it's unlike any other place in the world and we need to really appreciate that so I, I'm very grateful for the partnership and what people are trying to achieve I just think it's most of these option B's are just a little too much um, to dial it back a little bit so those are my remarks thank you Commissioner White um, Commissioner Argo um, wanted to say a couple of things and I, um, I made some notes um, as the other commissioners have. And I think the I, I, I agree with a lot of, I'm not quite as concerned about the over-programming as some are. Um, I think it probably could be scaled back some, but I wouldn't think that would be dramatic for me. Um, I remember when we took our tour today, probably the most, and maybe it's because I've got a slew of grandchildren right now that are school age, but um, it was, you remember when all the kids came down? You know, there were, I think they were, didn't we agree they were like sixth or seventh grade or something like that? And there were, there, like you see all over Washington, you know, this time of year and then further into the summer. And um, they were coming down the towpath, they were looking around. Um, it, it really highlighted for me what the experience could be from an educational standpoint. 
um, for young people as well as everybody else. And they were, like I was, you know, stumbling along this, you know, kind of cruddy, rocky path right now um, that is, I would say, dangerous in some places and difficult, yeah, I mean, and difficult to walk. And I, I mean, those, those things are obvious, I think, in terms of what needs to be done. But this is more to support the nation of education, I mean, the notion of educational programming and the space that's envisioned. And I'm trying to remember what, what part, you know, what part that is. And I thought that, um, and I thought that was so important for um, carrying through on um, what everybody's talked about too, and several people have said, sort of unlocking the potential of conveying what the important history is here and what this was like and what kids in the sixth and seventh grade right now can't even imagine, you know, and where do they have a chance to see that now in old history books? Or I guess online. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean but the pictures are the same, right? So I wanted to make a point like that, and I think it was Miss Steele, was it, that was talking about um, the busy waterfront, um, what it was like, uh, you know, historically, the tobacco trading, all of that kind of business. Um, preserving the, uh, I, I, to me, there is no conflict between preserving authenticity, unlocking potential of a, an exciting and authentic place that was unique and um, without destroying the historical character. And I think by and large the plans do that. I mean, that's, that's my feeling. And I think there was one other comment somebody made that I thought um, was really interesting. I think it was, um, yeah, Bob said, Peck said, balancing the, um, the history an interpretation of that history with the best aspects of an urban park, which I thought was a, you know, was a comprehensive kind of comment on that. Um, and someone else, I think, from the Georgetown Heritage Board said, there is really the potential, the, the possibility of unlocking potential and not having it remain a relic, which if you've walked down that path today, um, it's pretty sad. And there's, you know, and there's, you know, there's not a hint, really, until you get to some of the places where the locks are being repaired and everything, for really pulling in and understanding what this place was, and you know, and how interesting that is. So, those are my comments. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dixon. Uh, first, I uh, am always impressed with the work of the staff and the communities and engagement with them. And my, my colleagues have said much more than I can speak to, but uh, I agree with them, all of them collectively. Uh, but I'm also excited about the fact that this is a great educational opportunity for young people because they don't have to go to the Suez Canal or the Panama to <laughs> understand what a lock system is. I mean, that's a very that's an engineering <clears throat> feat and a concept which was used so, so long ago. That has to be, kids they need to understand that, to elevate, raise things to another level. So I think it's, it's great that we're doing this, and I think that the educational value, particularly in my perspective, the engineering side of the lock systems is very important. Put them out without going too far. Thank you. Mr. May. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I appreciate the staff's report. I, and I appreciate all the comments that we heard today. And that's exactly what we're looking for at this moment because we are very early in the process. Even though some of us have been involved in it for several years now uh, and in some ways several exhausting years uh, because of the challenges that, you know, that, the, uh, uh, that are inherent in a project like this given its location, given its, uh, its age, uh, given the use that it has had and, and uh, given the challenges that we have in, in simply maintaining it uh, the way it has been. Um, and it has been an extraordinary effort so far. And, and uh, um, uh, you know, I appreciate the, the comparisons to other prominent uh, projects, uh, linear park <laughs> projects that uh, uh, have demonstrated um, the extraordinary potential of 
uh, of, of an asset like this. Um, it is inherently different from the High Line, and uh, that's something that we have said repeatedly and have tried to keep everyone's expectations in line, because the last thing that we can do is have something like the High Line replicated here. It would, um, it would wind up being, I think, a terrible experience and uh, would do too much damage and would not be sustainable. Um, it, we can't handle the crowds. In fact, even the High Line can't handle the crowds that they get now. Um, but we couldn't do it here. So we've always been trying to exercise a certain amount of restraint. Um, and what we are, we are in terms of our process is that we want to understand what the limits are of what we can do. And I think that we will wind up um, ratcheting back on some of these things and restraining things a little bit more uh, as it develops. And it's obviously uh, something that's going to happen in pieces, right? I mean, it's 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 very difficult to even show this as an overall plan simply because there are so many components to it, and we would never be able to bring all of this at once and get sort of everything blessed design-wise at once. Um, it, you know, it's just it's going to be a challenging thing as we as we try to advance any of these concepts. Um, so, but we're glad to show everyone what it looks like right now and get this initial feedback and see where things go. Um, in terms of the, some of the particular comments that have been made, um, it, it was not obvious today because there's no water in the canal, but uh, people actually do uh, kayak and canoe on the canal as it is right now. Uh, and they, they rent boats at uh, Fletcher's and they come all the way down into Georgetown. And uh, the, we have been talking for years with the Georgetown bid about putting in a temporary dock that would test the idea of people being able to do that right from Georgetown. And believe it or not, there is, I think, a substantial interest in it. And if we can go ahead and do a temporary, uh, we may do that and be able to test it so that we understand whether it really makes sense or whether it is more trouble than it's worth. Uh, don't really know. Um, certainly the, um, uh, the canal boat itself and, uh, and the operation of mules is something that has been in the works for a very long time. You know, we've, we've I think, ordered the boat. <laughs> Um, and it's not been, because, you know, the old boat went out of business a while ago, it was not in good shape. Um, and so that's, that'll happen and we'll have the mules. Uh, I don't think there's any question about that. That's something that we have previously done and would continue to do. Um, I think that the, um, uh, some of the other aspects of this, uh, you know, I think that we want to take advantage of some of those uh, spots that we have, uh, certainly where the locks occur, what we have uh, on the, s the screen right now, I mean, that's a, uh, a tremendous educational opportunity. It's, a, a, uh, it's also, uh, I mean, it's one of the wider sections where you can um, get a, a, you know, a, a, a better view of everything that's around it and, uh, um, and you can actually have people assemble and there have been, you know, concerts and events that have occurred there over the years. It's, um, you know, we want to be able to do things like that. W you know, we also live in fear of overactivation in many parks. I mean, we know that that's the, you know, I, I can't tell you how many, I, I don't think I can go into a room with a landscape architect without somebody telling us about needing to activate a particular space, right? I, um, and I appreciate that and, and understand the desire to, but sometimes we also have to have our quiet places as well. And the canal is unique in, in that it can offer both, right? It is a place you can walk through and you can ex experience that huge crowd that might be gathered here or the, the, the big gang of, of students who will be trooping through um, or this, you know, a, a bunch of cyclists riding through. But, you, you know, there are also these quiet moments where you can stop and sit on the wall and just what, see what's going on. So um, anyway, it, it's a very exciting opportunity. It's also an exhausting opportunity. Um, and uh, we look forward to bringing it back for as it is developed further. Mr. Chairman, I just want to add, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to speak in favor of the mules, of course, and also the kayaks. I tell you, you know, one of the most things that impressed me most, most in other canals I've, I've observed, Suez, Panama, and others, that when you see a sailboat go through, along with a hand mac huge boat, you realize this has some human value here. And that's what the kids would get, the others would get with the kayaks going through the canal. They would see that it's not just made for hauling <coughs> large boats with cargo on it, people, but for individuals to use and to get you from one point and to another point. So that's how it works. Okay, well, thank you. I, I think just uh, I'm not going to repeat any of this because uh, there was so much, and I, I think the staff and 
everyone. The collaboration has been extraordinary. And I uh, really appreciate that. I just want to add that uh, the notion of creating the kind of opportunity to experience the canal in which today it is primarily not accessible to most people. It's a curiosity. It's a sort of how do you get there? How do I, how do I understand it? And then what is the story? And if we can achieve that through this, it's, I think, a very exciting intervention that will be uh, uh, certainly seems achievable within the ambitions laid out in the concept plan. So, uh, so I would move. Thank you. We have a motion to accept the comments as proposed. Uh, do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you all very much. We appreciate that feedback, and thank you for all the speakers. Um, next is agenda item 6B, approval of preliminary site development plans for the National Native American Veterans Memorial submitted by the Smithsonian Institution. Ms. Lee will make her presentation. Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, members of the Commission. Nice. The Smithsonian Institution has submitted a preliminary site development plans for the National Native American Veterans Memorial located on the grounds of the National Museum of the American Indian. Constructed in 2004, the National Museum of the American Indian is located on the southeast end of the National Mall in southwest Washington, D.C. The museum is bounded by Jefferson Drive to the north, 3rd Street to the east, 4th Street to the west, Maryland and Independence Avenues to the south. The east wing of the National Gallery is located to the north across the National Mall. The Air and Space Museum is to the west. The Botanic Garden and the U.S. Capitol building are located to the east. The memorial will be located in the existing wooded area on the northeast corner of the museum grounds, near the intersection of Jefferson Drive and 3rd Street. As you may recall, the Smithsonian provided a site visit and information presentation to the Commission four months ago. Since then, the project team has refined the memorial design and provided details about the materials and landscape. Authorized by Congress in 1994, the memorial will give all Americans the opportunity to learn of the proud and courageous tradition of service of Native Americans in the armed forces of the United States. The memorial has four design principles, encompass all Native American communities of the United States, include all service branches of the armed forces, honor past, present, and future Native American veterans, and create a contemplative area within the existing landscape. The memorial will be completed by Veterans Day 2020. The next few slides show images of existing conditions. Here you can see the memorial site from Jefferson Drive, during the winter. The adjacent sidewalks along 3rd Street and Jefferson Drive and the low perimeter security wall that surrounds the museum grounds. Here you can see the river walk flanked by trees on the mall side and a linear water feature on the building side. Also you can see the constructed wetlands it's in here. And here you can see the grandfather rocks and the welcome plaza. The original landscape design for the museum consists of forests and wetlands located to the north and east, meadows and croplands located to the south. Here is the existing circulation diagram. You can see pedestrian crosswalks at the intersections shown in blue, bus drop-off areas along Jefferson Drive shown in orange, and the museum loading dock along 4th Street shown in red. The building has a unique access experience. It is the only museum with an east-facing main entrance and without direct access from the National Mall. The museum has two entrances. Each entrance has an adjacent circular plaza. The main entrance is located to the east facing the U.S. Capitol, and the secondary entrance is located to the south 
at the intersection of Independence and Maryland Avenues. Most visitors enter the museum grounds from the northwest corner of the site. They walk for about 430 feet until they reach the welcome circle. The main entrance can also be accessible from the southeast corner of the site near the intersection of Maryland Avenue and 3rd Street. Here you can see the memorial in context with the museum grounds. The river walk and the welcome circle are shown in red and the memorial footprint is shown in pink. The memorial will cantilever over the existing wetlands. As you can see, the memorial will require minor changes to the existing landscape. However, it will avoid disrupting the existing cistern that provides stormwater management for the museum. The memorial design is inspired by four elements. Drum vibrations to encourage people to gather, four cardinal directions to provide different access points, wind to activate prayer cloths, and light touch to respect the landscape. You can see the slender concrete piers that will support the memorial. The memorial will occupy a total of 2,837 square feet. The design consists of a circular contemplative gathering space with a vertical sculpture as the centerpiece. The memorial components include an eight foot wide approach walk, a title walk, an outer path of life, an inner path of harmony, circular seat walls, benches, and open areas for wheelchairs, four lances on top of the seat walls, a fountain that symbolizes a drum, the warrior circle of honor sculpture on top of the fountain, concentric light fixtures integrated into the fountain, and a railing. The title wall will be three feet and six inches in height. It will be clad with Virginia mist granite, which is the same paving and side walls materials for the museum grounds. The wall will support stainless steel letters the five seals of the armed forces will be etched into the granite cladding. The land's materials consist of a stainless steel <coughs> shaft with bronze feathers on top. Integrated rings at the base of the lands will allow visitors to tie prayer cloths. The seat walls step down to meet the water and up towards the sidewalk to create a buffer from the street noise. The sculpture and fountain will be approximately 13 feet in height. The proposed fire at the base of the sculpture will be used during ceremonies. You can see a close-up view of the sculpture. The vertical ring will be made out of stainless steel. The paving, seat walls, and fountain will be also constructed of Virginia Miss granite, consistent with the museum grounds material palette. Here is a view from the corner of 3rd Street and Jefferson Drive towards the memorial. And here is a view from the Welcome Circle near the museum's main entrance. So moving on to staff analysis. The staff analysis is organized into four topics, including visitor experience, environment, railing design, and lighting. During the information presentation in February, the commission commented on the lack of direct access to the museum and memorial from the National Mall and suggested the applicant explore a new mid-block pedestrian connection along Jefferson Drive near the existing amphitheater. As I mentioned earlier, the memorial will be served by the two existing routes that lead to the museum entry today. One from the northwest corner of the site, which is approximately 500 feet away from the memorial and the other near the southeast corner of the site, which is approximately 250 feet away. Smithsonian has responded that any direct access into the memorial would detract from the memorial procession and contemplative character. Staff supports this position. However, we still find that a new mid-block access point along Jefferson Drive could improve museum access because it would provide a more direct and visible connection from the National Mall. We also understand the timing and budget considerations. Therefore, staff recommends Smithsonian analyze visitation increase and circulation patterns to see whether it may warrant a separate project in the future. A modest access point could be located in the vicinity of the existing amphitheater connecting the Jefferson Drive sidewalk with the river walk 
to avoid disrupting the contemplative memorial experience and minimizing changes to the existing landscape. The Commission also recommended careful attention to the memorial scale to avoid overpowering the wetlands. Smithsonian performed an occupancy analysis and determined that the memorial is appropriately sized for its program. However, to minimize impacts to the wetland, the design team reduced the diameter of the circular gathering space by approximately 3 feet and 3 inches from 50 feet to 46 feet and 9 inches. The proposal also includes changes to the wetland edge. The wetland is a water feature constructed in 2004 as part of the museum landscape design. The wetland collects rainwater and has an overflow drain to release water into the sewer during major storm events. The black line indicates the original wetland footprint as built in 2004. Over the last 15 years, the wetland has grown 30% larger than the 2004 boundary due to erosion at the banks, as shown in blue. The proposed design, shown in red, will reduce the existing wetland by 12% to accommodate the memorial. Although the footprint will change, the proposed wetland will be larger than the original 2004 design, shown in black. The project will include edge stabilization to limit erosion at the north edge through rocks and deep-rooted plantings. Staff supports Smithsonian efforts to protect and restore the wetlands edge biodiversity to enhance the site's ecological quality and scenic character. The museum landscape is unique to the National Mall given the dense forest and wetland ecosystem. The design intent is to preserve the integrity of the landscape and provide a natural framework for the memorial. Five trees, shown in red, will be removed due to conflicts with the memorial. Six new trees, shown in dark green, will be planted consistent with the original museum landscape palette. The landscape plan will include native trees, shrubs, and perennials, aquatic plants, and meadow plants. As the design evolves, staff recommends the applicant provide a landscape plan that addresses tree replacement in compliance with the comprehensive plan. As I mentioned, both the cistern and the wetlands serve as stormwater management practices for the museum. The project includes a small bioretention area close to the memorial site, integrated into the landscape. Staff requests a stormwater management plan that addresses compliance with federal and local regulations. The design includes a protective guardrail at the southern edge of the approach walk and around the circular gathering space as shown in the blue dash line. The metal railing system is composed of horizontal rails with secondary vertical elements and intermittent path lighting integrated into the railing. The guardrail along the approach walk protects people from falling into the wetland. Here you can see the guardrail along the water edge. Staff recommends that the applicant simplify the railing design to minimize visual impacts and its heavy composition and avoid competing with the memorial elements, landscape, and the museum's architecture. Finally, the design includes lighting integrated into the fountain, the railing, the path, and the base of the seat walls. Staff requests a lighting plan and night views consistent with the overall lighting design of the museum that minimize light pollution and respect the U.S. Capitol as the most prominent feature in the nighttime skylight. To conclude, the executive uh, director's recommendation is for the commission to approve the preliminary site development plans for the, native, for the National Native American Veterans Memorial, recommend Smithsonian analyze visitation increase and circulation pattern, to evaluate whether an additional access point could improve access from the National Mall, recommend that the applicant simplify the railing design, request that the applicant provide a, night, a lighting plan, a night views, a landscape, and stormwater management plan. With this, I conclude my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions, and the applicant and design team are available as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is for a preliminary site development plan comment. So um, I'd like to open up for any comments or questions. Comment. Um, I <clears throat> really appreciate the work on this. And 
I just wanted to make sure I heard, I think I heard you correctly, um, uh, the railing, and you had staff recommendations to do what exactly? The railing looked very um, busy to me in terms of, of, yeah, that would, that were obstructive essentially to the view that they were trying to create. And I just wanted to be clear because we went through that pretty fast. Yeah, uh, so basically we want to simplify the design because yeah. it's too heavy and yeah. it's blocking views and competing right. with, the, with the building, museum, yeah. the landscape, and also <coughs> the simplicity of the memorial. Right. Simplicity. Yeah, that's exactly right. A little more simple. That was all that was that caught my eye and I wanted to make sure I heard the staff report correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wright. Um, what's the annual visitation for the museum? Good afternoon, Commissioner Gallus and other commissioners. The annual, I'm Ann Trowbridge, Associate Director for Planning. The annual visitation is approximately 1.1 to 1.2 million visitors per year to the museum. Okay, so the reason I asked that, um, and 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 would you say that the museum feels like that they want to? In okay, everybody always wants more of everything, but is the museum? <laughs> it, does that feel like a a number that 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 the museum is desperate to increase? Uh, we're always. I, wanting I, to increase our visitation I, right. in person I, and online. I'm assuming that. But, but um, that museum has the capacity to accommodate more visitors very comfortably. Yeah. Um, I mean, the reason I'm asking is because um, I don't think I agree with the midpoint, the mid-block access recommendation. And the reason I don't think I do is because I don't know if the juice is worth the squeeze. Um, you, you, you'd be disrupting a really beautiful composition, I think, by doing that. Um, and, I, and I get it if you were getting, you know, 250,000 people a year. But given the numbers, I mean, relatively speaking, a million people a year is nothing to sneeze at. Um, and, and I wonder if the disruption of this, what I think is already a beautiful composition in terms of landscape, um, bifurcating that, that block, for lack of another term, seems a risky business. Um, um, and the, the redesign of the, I mean, and, and the accommodations that, that, that Ms. Lee described for the <coughs> memorial seem to be very sensitively approached and, and aren't doing that. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I hate to say this because it's in the EDR, but I don't think I agree with that. Um, because it's, because it's, it, it's um, I also think that we're so lazy as Americans. If you have to walk a half a block to get into the building, which you can clearly see from the mall, well, maybe you should. Maybe you should go that extra 500 feet or whatever it is and, and, and move it around the block and find the entrance. Um, I, think the, I, th I think so far so good on this. The, the, um, when we saw the memorial um, in the information presentation um, in February, I was really charmed by the, all of it. The story, the logic, the logical underpinnings for the design so, so I, I, I guess my, um, what I'm hoping is that, that we just leave it alone after the memorial is, is put in because it's a very subtle change or, or a series of subtle changes that are going to be made to the landscape and the hardscape, and I think we should just leave it at that. Thank you. Other comments? Commissioner May. Yeah. Uh so, uh, you know, I think generally speaking, I agree with the uh, executive director's recommendation. Um, I do think that there's been some positive evolution of the design. I think it's, it's gotten a little bit smaller and a little bit simpler. And, I, you know, from the beginning, I was recommending that the, the circle was, was too big and that it needed to shrink a bit. And I 
I think it, it has gotten a little smaller, or at least feels a little smaller. Um, and I absolutely agree that the, this rail um, needs to be simplified because it is, I mean, while there is some affinity between the, the, the vertical members and the, the, the uh, aquatic vegetation that we're seeing, um, or the, the wetland ve vegetation that we're seeing there, um, it's still it's still just too busy and, and uh, obstructs too much of the view. And I think something that's um, Thompson better. I know it's not an easy thing doing a curved uh, rail like that and not have it, you know, be perceived as having a lot of density when you look at it on the angle like that. But I think that there's certainly some things that can be done. So um, I, I strongly agree that that's something that needs to be studied further. Um, and uh, you know, as far as the access, uh, the 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 additional access, I guess directly to the north, the mall, um, I tend to agree with uh, uh, Commissioner Wright on this. Um, initially, I wasn't necessarily in that camp when we first started discussing this design, um, based on the site visit. Well, yeah, go back to the site, the overall site. So, yeah, it just uh, uh, thank you. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not persuaded that there need to be there needs to be another access point, and I think that in many ways it would be disruptive to the commemorative and contemplative nature of the of the memorial to to encourage. Um, you know, those additional access points wherever they might be. At one point, I was worried that um, people would, you know, particularly some of the younger people visiting the memorial would, you know, hop up on the on the low wall and come through the the uh, uh, the planted area, the the forest, whatever you want to call that area. Um, but I'm 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 less concerned about that now, and I think that that's something that should be managed through the the type of vegetation that's planted. To discourage that kind of cut through, certainly don't want to have people cutting through at any point along that northern side and creating a sort of a social trail through the woods. Um, but I, I think that it's important to kind of keep it the way it is. So I, I would be supportive of, of tweaking the the EDR if that's where where uh, Commissioner Wright would like to go. Um, I do think that uh, the wetland itself uh, might be improved by a kayak dock. <laughs> 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 just kidding. How about a canoe? How about you just, a canoe? You just put me out yourself. You let us have a mule as well. Uh, Too much of a good thing here. <laughs> I, you know, it's going to be a long day, so we <laughs> have to enjoy it. Somehow. I think so. Uh, any other comments at this point? <coughs> Commissioner White. Well, first I'd love to hear the staff's response to the mid-block. I wasn't here in February, and so I didn't have the site visit, so I'd like to understand a little better where the recommendation came from, from the materials that said that the commission um, commented. So if we could just hear a response. And I appreciate that things evolve over time, and as the, as the plan evolved, it may change folks' minds, but I'd like to understand that background. But I, I just wanted to say about the memorial itself that I think it's really stunning and uh, the simplicity is really powerful and the symbolism. So I, I congratulate the, the artist and the designers because it's a really beautiful plan. And I think the, the staff review and how the details were so important in working through. Um, again, I'm agnostic on the mid-block connection, but the rest of it I think is really very well done and look forward to seeing the further plans. Thank you. I'm sure our team in Oklahoma is listening to the webcast. Good. Huh. Did someone want to comment on the mid-block connection? Yeah. yeah. So that was something that came up during the site visit in February um, because right now, as you, can, as you saw in the picture, there is a, a side wall around the museum grounds, so you can only access it from the northwest corner. And so for people like in wheelchairs, so there is a small ramp here, so you have to go like 500 feet. So I think that's what it came from. 
but we also understand that this is the experience of the museum, that you come through the river walk and then there is very beautiful uh, landscape and forested areas. And so that's why it came from. Because that's 250. And, and could, yeah, just to also clarify, the EDR does not necessarily condition this approval on providing the walk or the midpoint access. It asks to study it, it based on visitation trends and some of the things that you asked for. I think at the end of the day, the question really is, this may benefit the museum more than a memorial, so you don't necessarily want to burden this memorial project with that larger decision. So this was asking for a study. It wasn't necessarily asking for it to be provided uh, at the end of the day. <coughs> So, Commissioner Cash. So I think at the last meeting I was I mentioned that I thought that this could be something useful to look at because I think that my concern when we went out there to the site last time is that it felt like there was no connectivity to the mall itself. And for folks that might be interested in going and visiting a, a, a memorial and not necessarily going to the museum itself, it almost like directed you to go all the way around and into the museum's front door. So I think that was the thought at, at the time. Um, I'm not necessarily wedded to it one way or the other, but I remember when we were on the site, there was some concern, especially in the, the northeast corner that people might be jumping over in to, to get into there to, to maybe have some kind of connection to discourage that, which I think the new fence definitely discourages that. But um, uh, so I think that that was some of the thought behind it, just kind of having more access for the memorial itself. Because I think that I expressed some concern last time too that this will be the Smithsonian's kind of first crack at actually running a memorial site versus NPS doing it. And you might have folks that just want to come down for the memorial and just create a better connection to the mall itself. But I'm not necessarily wedded to it one way or the other. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm just one of the lazy Americans. I'm not a planner. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Dixon, uh, I think that the. Uh, there's some philosophical comment about the, it's about the journey, not about the destination. And I think when the presentation was made to us, there's some name they gave that path, and it was part of the uh, symbol, symbolism of the of the of the uh, uh, of the of the, of the memorial that you would walk that path to get to it. And I think that there is something about that that I think we should see we should maintain. And I remember the discussion, uh, and I thought maybe it was a good idea myself when I heard it. But now I think that it, it does break the, the idea of, of the journey to the memorial as being meaningful and, and thoughtful. And by the time you get there, we don't want to have a shortcut to it, you know. So uh, away from it. Path of life. Path of life, yes. I knew there was a name that came. <laughs> so that's you saying that's part of the experience. Yes. Yeah. Isn't, isn't the journey always part of the experience? Wow. There, I don't know if we can follow anything with that. I, I have a very, I have a, I, I can't follow that kind of depth of, of thought. I have a very minor uh, question about the, the, the fence or the railing. Um, just to, as you, you investigate that a little bit more, I, I just encourage you to think about whether that becomes a climbable thing, or you, we don't want to encourage that, of course. So just understanding that aspect of it as you consider the possible design uh, direction there. Uh, yes, we will. Thank you. Quick, Commissioner Argo. Uh, just a quick comment. To um, echo Commissioner May's comment, I think it would be, and I think this is maybe intuitive already, but those of us who stood on during the presentation on that corner where we thought people could cut in, I guess, north northeast corner, is that right? That to have a robust, and I think you already mentioned this, Peter, but to have the, in the next phase of the design a, a, a robust um, landscape plan that would be, you know, that would be addressing that you know, that concern about that being a potential access point, that's all. Um, and, and to have that called out in the plan, I think, would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think at this point I'm going to ask Commissioner Wright whether you want to amend the EDR or are you okay with it the way it's written in terms of study only? It doesn't mandate any approach. To, what, I don't know. Can What's we go the, back what, to what the EDR? The, it just asks consideration of it. 
right? It doesn't ask for a full-blown study, does it? The recommends. Page two. Consider. Uh, that's not the same. Right? Recommends oh, the Smithsonian Institute to analyze visitation increase in circulation patterns. Uh, and evaluate. And evaluate. Yeah. Whether it could improve that. Smithsonian, have you analyzed and and um, c circulation patterns and visitation numbers and evaluated an additional access point already as um, part of design yes development? No. It, as part of this project, we have analyzed the capacity of the memorial path and the memorial itself to accommodate visitors, and we believe it's satisfactory. The idea of a... Um, shortcut, so to speak, between Jefferson and the River Walk uh, at the museum has been looked at before in a previous study. We also uh, discussed it last year with uh, the original landscape architects, Roger Courtney, uh, formerly with EDAW, EDAW yeah. and uh, also John Paul Jones of Seattle. And their feeling was that if we were in the future going to consider it, which we aren't right now, uh, that the appropriate place to consider might be uh, in conjunction with opening up at the North Cardinal Rock, which is kind of directly on axis with the center of the circular lobby along that north edge. If they had is that a on place. a site map? And, map. Um, so I think going forward in a few years after this opens, if we find that for some reason uh, we think that would be a good idea to start, we'd, we'd, we'd think about that. It would be to the left of where uh, Vivian is shown, kind of due north of the center of oh. the main lobby. <coughs> uh, there's a rock that marks the north um, but that, and that the museum and that the, those set of considerations took place before the before plans the, for memorial the memorial were even okay. So, so our so preference you, would be to study this if needed in the future and not be part of this project. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dixon, I'm uh, I'm, I'm actually I'm finding this actually humorous and annoying, and I think that. <laughs> In the future, I'm not going to wear this hat because it may be affecting me. I don't know. <laughs> but, but actually, no, it's wear, sitting next actually, to me. Actually, I got this in Madagascar, so I like it once in a while. I'll put it on just for fun. <laughs> but, what, you know, we, we, are, we, are, we are now trying to figure out how to create a pathway through a Native American memorial. Uh, is, is this oil line? Is this oil, is a pipeline we're putting through? What's, what oh. are we doing here? I mean, oh, no. are we going to get in here and start? modifying a spiritual memorial because we're trying to find passageways to other things. I don't know. So would you like to amend the EER to remove this? I think we should take out this. any discussion about studying this. I mean, obviously things evolve, but I don't think we should be a part of it right now. I, 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 right? I think that's kind of my inclination, too, is to leave it alone for now. And after the memorial is built, if social trails are being made, if people are jumping over the walls, you, you'll know it. And just um, check with the natives when that happens. <laughs> the Native Americans who belongs. <laughs> uh, it, it does feel, uh, it, it feels maybe that may, now is not the time to ask for this. So if we amended the, uh, I, I don't want to drag us through this bureaucratic process exactly. if, if people are going to vote it no. Are we in the mood to strike this from the EDR? I'm inclined to strike the, the recommends the, the Smithsonian analyze Visitation increased circulation by that paragraph. No, <laughs> well, I just, I, you know, I, I don't, it, it's not critical to this memorial. It is something that the Smithsonian needs to be thinking about anyway right, on the their future. own. They don't need us to tell them okay. to do it, and they got enough to do to design this. And right, I, so, you know, so I, I, I want to make it easier on them. Let's, I move that we strike the recommendation for further second. consideration of the mid block. Oh. And, and, and how about the fines? The one. Um, well, that's part and parcel of it, yeah. right? So the fines statement so and, fines the and the recommend. Second that, too. <laughs> okay, <laughs> any discussion on that recommended amendment to strike reference to the mid-block connection? Any further discussion? Okay. Oh, Commissioner White. 
I guess I just have a question to understand um, what I thought I heard Ms. Trowbridge say, that they would prefer to wait and see how this works and then look at it. Right. Do we want to make reference to that? No. that or just that the Smithsonian will do that? Uh, we're happy to do that on our own. We don't need the recommendations. Okay. So but you uh, intend to, I, I'm just, I just want to make sure I was clear up. that you uh, intend to do that in any event because you want to see how circulation. We we're going to see how but it goes. But it's not yeah. related to this so memorial. It would be a new project, new funding. People are jumping over the walls to get to yeah. the memorial. They're going to have to do something, right? I mean, they'll know that. I think. Uh, Pricker bushes would be cheaper, but we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, any further discussion on the amendment? Uh, do we need to re... So we need to vote on the, the amendment. I, I think that uh, the action is to strike uh, the two... Uh, recommend or the two components the one that says finds the one that says recommends and it's just striking those from the EDR correct okay let's uh, signify so moved. Uh, it's been and moved seconded. and seconded so let's take a vote on this amendment uh, all those in favor of striking the language referring to the mid block connection please signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. all opposed Okay, that, that motion is carried. The EDR is amended. Are we ready to move on the a, a motion to approve the amended EDR? So moved. And seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the amended uh, EDR, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. <coughs> nice work, team. Okay, now I think we're going to uh, bring in the model. We're excited to see the Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden model that will be brought into the middle of the room. I'll go ahead and introduce uh, item agenda item 6C, which is the approval of comments on concept design for the Hirshhorn Museum Sculpture Garden Revitalization, submitted by the Smithsonian Institution. And Mr. Webb will make the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the commission. The Smithsonian Institution has submitted concept design plans for the Hirshhorn Museum Sculpture Gardens Revitalization for your review and comment. The concept design presents an opportunity to rehabilitate and revitalize the sculpture garden to expand opportunities for additional museum programming while addressing much needed accessibility and maintenance issues. The project is expected to be submitted for preliminary and final reviews by the Commission in early 2020. The Sculpture Garden is located at 700 Independence Avenue Southwest on the National Mall and is part of the Hirshhorn Museum Complex. The Hirshhorn Complex is framed by 7th Street to the east, the Mary Livingston Ripley Garden to the west, and across Jefferson Drive, the Sculpture Garden opens to the National Mall along its northern edge. Jefferson Drive is controlled by the National Park Service. The museum and garden are organized around the 8th Street north-south axis aligning with the National Gallery of Art Sculpture Garden and the National Archives across the National Mall to the north. Now, before I walk you through the concept design components, I would like to provide you, provide you a brief history of the Sculpture Garden. Staff notes that in 2016, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden were determined eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places, while already considered contributing elements to the National Mall Historic District's listing. Designed by Gordon Bunshaft of Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill as a component of the Hirshhorn Museum Complex and completed in 1974, Bunshaft's design for the sculpture garden was shaped by concrete retaining walls on the east, south, and west with a planted berm opening to the National Mall at the north. 
Within these bounds, sculpture was displayed through a series of gravel-paved austere terraces and framed by, by a few internal concrete walls <coughs> and hedges. It was accessed by a single set of broad stairs from the north and a pair of lateral stairs from the south, with a second series of wide stairs leading to the central reflecting pool. Staff notes that the remaining Bunshaft design, el design features have been determined to contribute to the National Register eligibility of the garden, including the sunken plan, the concrete perimeter and inner partition walls, the reflecting pool, the north and south stairs, and the setting for display of rotating sculpture. In addition, staff finds the sunken garden space is a fundamental feature of the original Bunshaft design, and the proposed revitalization will not alter the relationship of the garden's elevation to the National Mall. Soon after opening, the sculpture garden proved inhospitable due to the expanse of gravel and lack of shade in the hot, humid D.C. summers. Additionally, visitor access to the sunken garden was entirely dependent on stairs, making it inaccessible to visitors with strollers or wheelchairs and persons with limited mobility. Landscape architect Lester Collins made modifications to the garden that were completed in 1981, layered on top of Bunshaft's design to improve accessibility and visitor comfort through the introduction of ramped walkways, shade trees, and ground cover plantings. The visitor pathways that are now paved in brick were defined by planting beds or lawn. As such, st staff finds that the sculpture garden has changed substantially over time in response to improving visitor access and environmental comfort. Staff also notes that the Collins, uh, the Collins era design elements introduced to the garden in 1981 will need to be reevaluated as part of the Section 106 consultation process to determine if they now contribute to the significance of the sculpture garden. Before we look at the concept design and its objectives, here are a few slides of the existing conditions of the garden. The sculpture garden is, a, is in a prominent location on the National Mall, and changes should ensure a high quality space that supports the mission of the museum and engages, engages the surrounding context. As identified by the applicant, the goals of the concept design for the garden include reinforcing connections between the National Mall the sculpture garden and the museum, and enhancing visitor experience and public engagement. As a reminder, the Commission approved the Smithsonian South Mall Campus Master Plan on June 7, 2018. It included recommendations to improve and revitalize both the Hirshhorn Museum and the sculpture garden, and the Commission supported the reestablishment of the existing below grade connection between the museum and the sculpture garden to help improve access between the two areas. This is included in today's concept uh, design. As I mentioned earlier, the applicant's design presents an opportunity to rehabilitate and revitalize the sculpture garden to address the following goals of the Hirshhorn Museum. Reinforce the connections between the National Mall, sculpture garden, and museum, enhance visitor experience and public engagement, create flexible space for artists working to push the media of sculpture and performance forward into the 21st century, show the museum's historically significant bronze sculpture collection to its strongest effect, revitalize and build upon the historic framework of the sculpture garden, and replace failing infrastructure to meet current code requirements and design for resilience and sustainability. The museum has selected renowned artist and architect Hiroshi Sugimoto to realize the project's cur curatorial and programming goals. As such, staff recommends that the Commission supports the Smithsonian's intention to revitalize the Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden to improve the, the visitor experience and public engagement and accommodate the museum's mission and contemporary programming needs. Further, staff recommends that the Commission find that the components of the revitalization can reinforce and improve the connections between the mall, the sculpture garden, and the museum. And further, the revitalization must balance the visitor experience, program needs, and historic preservation considerations. Now we will shift to a discussion of the applicant's programming goals. One of the goals of the project is to accommodate new and flexible spaces for the presentation of contemporary sculpture and performance art. 
While the mission of the museum remains the same, the types of art and the potential for exhibition continues to change, and the garden should accommodate those changes. In particular, staff notes that the museum and garden has a need to accommodate interactive art, larger sculpture, and other contemporary installation, in addition to the bronze sculpture collection displayed today, and finds that the sculpture garden should be revitalized to accommodate new, flexible, and varied opportunities for museum programming. The concept design responds to the muse museum's vision by creating distinct garden spaces and galleries, as shown in the following renderings. The East Garden will contain a series of interconnected open galleries for the Hirschhorn's collection of modern bronze sculptures, allowing them to increase the number of rotating sculptures on display by 50%. The West Garden will provide an open, flexible lawn to showcase temporary exhibitions, interactive installations, public programming, and monumental sculptures by contemporary artists. The reflecting pool and performance area includes a shallow water feature in the central garden that will serve as a focal point for visitor engagement and reflection. Sugimoto's concept integrates a performance stage, a stacked stone backdrop, and shaded amphitheater seating to form an inviting venue for the performing arts. <clears throat> Improved entrances and new overlooks are envisioned on all sides of the garden as shown outlined here on the rendering in red. The north entrance will provide an enhanced front door to the National Mall, providing space for pause and reflection with clear vistas of the entire garden. Destination artworks positioned around the perimeter will draw visitors in, encouraging flow between the garden and the museum. New shaded seating will provide opportunities for rest and contemplation. As such, staff recommends the commission finds that the sculpture garden should be revitalized to accommodate new, flexible, and varied opportunities for museum programming. Now I'll walk you through the concept's proposed, proposed alterations to the garden and the vicinity, focusing on the underground tunnel passageway, the reflecting pool, the walls, and the overlooks. As shown in the top right image, when the Hirschhorn opened in 1974, it featured an underground passage be uh, below Jefferson Drive creating an important pedestrian link between the sunken sculpture garden and the museum plaza. The tunnel connecting the plaza and the garden were closed in 1993 due to safety concerns. Currently, as shown in the bottom left photo, a large scale artwork sits over the plaza tunnel entrance. The tunnel was later enclosed for use as a art lab educational space shown in the center bottom photo. The original granite stairs are still present at the back of the art lab, as shown in the bottom right photo. The tunnel's closure has impeded the original flow of visitors ever since, requiring visitors to exit the sculpture garden and cross Jefferson Drive to access the Herschel Museum. <coughs> the concept design proposes to reopen the tunnel connection. As proposed, the majority of the tunnel will remain intact. The north end will be widened to increase daylight into the space. The extent stairs will be restored and salvaged stair treads will be used to reopen the pedestrian link to the museum plaza. The size of the original plaza stair opening was just under 36 feet in length and surrounded by a concrete balustrade. The concept plan proposes to introduce more light into the stair as, they as you descend into the tunnel. This was one of the challenges with the original stair design <coughs> as it was dark and uninviting. The concept plan includes several alternatives to address this concern. The first alternative proposes to restore the stair entrance to its original opening size and install a walkable skylight over the base of the stairs to provide the desired sky, uh, daylighting. A second alternative proposes to maximize the enlargement of the stair passage to the tunnel but results in bisecting the historic monumental plaza entrance stairs. The third alternative, and the applicants preferred, proposes to enlarge the stair opening to bring daylight to the base of the stairs. This design would not impact the historic monumental plaza stairs rising from Jefferson Drive. The tunnel's original granite stairs would be restored. The balustrade would uh, resemble the original design but would meet current building codes. After review, staff supports reopening the tunnel between the museum and the garden to improve connectivity between the two areas 
and finds that the design alternatives to the stair opening to the tunnel each has historic preservation challenges, including introducing new materials such as the skylights or potentially altering the historic monumental plaza entrance stairs. The stairs and the tunnel should be inviting to users and additionally, uh, additional daylighting will be beneficial. As such, staff recommends that the commission supports the applicant's preferred approach for the stair opening to the tunnel under Jefferson Drive to expand the stair opening to the top of the monumental plaza entrance stairs without bisecting the stairs, which allows for the desired daylight into the stair entrance and tunnel. Now we will shift to a discussion of the reflecting pool contained within the garden. Bunshaft's 1974 design included a rectangular reflecting pool on the northern end of the sunken central garden with dimensions that link it to the windows and balcony on the north side of the, Hirsch, uh, of the museum building. The reflecting pool is a character defining feature for the sculpture garden's eligibility for the National Register. Thus, uh, staff finds the reflecting pool is a fundamental feature of the Bunshaft design and it relates the north window and balcony to the, uh, of the museum to the garden. While the Section 106 consultation process has begun, the applicant has not made a determination of effects on the garden's historic elements based on their proposed concept. While this will occur in the next step of the 106 process, as the concept design moves forward, staff requests the applicant provide additional details regarding the proposed pool modifications, including the design of the proposed stage and pedestrian paths, to demonstrate the impacts of any changes on the historic character of the pool and the visitor experience. Furthermore, staff recommends that the applicant explore a pool alternative that retains the historic character-defining dimensions of the Bunshaft's pool design. As part of the concept review under your consideration today, the applicant has included several alternatives for a redesign of the garden's reflecting pool, all of which significantly enlarge the size of the pool as it is today. And now we'll look at the proposed alternatives. The first alternative incorporates an enlarged shallow reflecting pool with a performance stage and sculptural pedestals. The enlarged pool would be approximately 85 feet by 56 feet compared to the existing reflecting pool of 62 feet by 14 feet. The pool would be six inches in depth and could be drained for performances. A second alternative expands the reflecting pool includes a performance area, but would incorporate the existing dimensions of, uh, of the Bunshot pool with a depth of six inches below grade, and the majority of the pool would be three inches below grade of the surrounding paving. A third alternative incorporates the dimensions of the pool within the enlarged uh, reflecting pool, but does not have a stage or pass through the pool, but could be drained for performances. A final pool alternative proposes to enlarge the pool with a performance stage, but with reduced dimensions that correspond to the actual width of the museum's balconies, museum balconies north windows. All the alternatives shown in the concept design would use honed black granite for the pool surface and stage components and a lighter stone for edging. Now I'll walk you through the proposed alteration to the, garden, the garden's walls. <clears throat> Within the sculpture garden, the walls mark the overall garden boundary while serving as retaining walls given the sunken nature of the garden. Under the concept plan, the original perimeter concrete aggregate, aggregate walls will be replaced with in-kind materials. These walls are indicated on this uh, site plan rendering circled in black. The replacement is needed due to the structural failing of the original walls. These walls will be rebuilt in the original locations with the in-kind materi in material consisting of sandblasting, sandblasted exposed crushed granite aggregate. These walls will also be slightly raised to meet the current building code. Thus, staff notes that the existing perimeter walls and stone aggregate are contributing elements to the garden design and directly relate the sculpture garden to the museum building itself. Staff recommends that the commission supports the efforts to replace the failing original perimeter aggregate walls of bunch staff's design with in-kind materials to maintain these character-defining elements. 
Staff also notes that the design proposes to remove the remaining bun shaft design interior <laughs> partition walls, including the central partition wall, as shown on this site plan outlined in red. The removal of the western partition walls allows for the creation of the western garden and the new access accessibility routes from both the north and south sides of the garden. The central partition wall will be, will be replaced with a new stacked stone backdrop wall. Staff also notes that the design proposes to remove the walls and ramps introduced by Collins in 1981 on the north, on the north side of the garden, as shown on, uh, in black on this drawing. New perimeter walls on the north will complete the shape of the garden at its perimeter, as well as to define two new elements of the garden, the enlarged north overlook and the new ramp, ramped west entry to the garden. The material will be concrete aggregate to complement the original bunch out <coughs> wall material. The Collins design ramps and stairs in the interior of the garden will, will be maintained, will maintain their alignment, but they will be reconstructed. Sugimoto's concept design proposes new stacked stone gallery walls meant to function as backdrops for art and further define new programmatic spaces for the garden. As shown in this diagram in blue, the new stone walls are always slightly lower than the concrete perimeter walls. As the applicant is attempting to form a distinctly different secondary system of organization, Therefore, staff recommends that the commission supports the introduction of the new walls to define space in the garden and serve as a backdrop for the sculpture collection. And here is a rendering of how the new stone gallery walls would look and photos that they use for inspiration. Staff has recommended the applicant continue to explore ways in which the new stone walls can be compatible with the historic perimeter materials, but differentiated through material, color tone, or stacking pattern. Both on the outside of the perimeter walls in the new overlooks and within the garden, new planter walls are proposed that frame raised planters and function as visitor seating benches. The raised planters alternate with plantings at, pavement at the pavement level and create benches at strategic locations throughout the sculpture garden. At the reflecting pool, benches are provided in tiers to serve as, as amphitheater seating. The concept plan includes alterations to the overlooks around the sculpture garden. For the no north overlook, the north entry will be widened to create a stronger connection to the mall, and the east and west overlooks create a transition zone between the surrounding site and the garden, while providing accessible view, op view opportunities, shaded seating, and the display of sculpture along 7th Street and the mall walkways for visitors. Therefore, staff recommends that the commission supports the reconfiguration and introduction of the overlooks to improve, uh, to improve the connectivity of the garden with the National Mall. The original garden, as I mentioned, was not accessible as it predated ADA requirements. The changes by Collins in the early 1980s incorporated ramps along the north side of the site and within the garden to allow for an accessible route down to the sculpture. Today, there is no accessible entrance or exit from Jefferson Drive, and the ramps at the north can only be reached via the gravel walk along the National Mall. As such, visitors from the south must travel completely around the site to gain access to the garden. The concept design proposes ramps accessible from both the north and south, providing universal access for all visitors. This is indicated on the drawing with the red arrow. The southern ramp is located across from the accessible entry on the Museum Plaza to help strengthen the campus connection. These changes will help shorten the travel distance for visitors. Thus, staff supports the improvements that enhance accessibility to and through the sculpture garden for visitors of all, uh, all abilities. In addition, staff does request that the applicant work with the National Park Service regarding any potential alternatives for Jefferson Drive that also improve pedestrian access. Now we'll shift into the landscaping and paving uh, concepts. The primary purpose of the Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden is the display of art and the creation of a venue for programming such as performances and other events. Therefore, the Hirshhorn's mission distinguishes the Sculpture Garden from other public gardens. 
The landscape concept expresses this need through the creation of a subdued and restrained plant palette, which encourages a focus on art display and the comfortable viewing of artworks. Turf is limited to the West Lawn to create a comfortable and inviting space for visitors. For the ground palette, simple planes of ground cover plants will provide a complementary base, and a single species per bed will create lush, textured carpeting of planting. The selection of hardy species will ensure limited maintenance needs and long-term sus uh, sustainability of the landscape. The number of trees, their canopy type, shape, and location were carefully studied to balance the need for open display areas with the critical need for shade. While most of the proposed trees are deciduous, some evergreens are provided in select locations to enhance the experience of the garden during the winter. Thus, staff recommends the commission finds the inclusion of trees and plantings throughout the garden enhance shade and are important for visitor comfort. In terms of materials, the garden sits are surrounded by exposed aggregate and fine gravel of the National Mall. The overlook and stair entrances from the north and south will use salvaged bunshaft stair treads with matching pavers to welcome visitors into the garden. The lower levels will integrate new granite stone pavers to coordinate with the existing stairs and the new gallery stone walls. In regards to lighting, the applicant has begun looking at a lighting plan that is appropriate for the garden's location on the National Mall and for its use and function. As the concept design moves forward, a more detailed lighting strategy will be provided. Overall, the concept design presents an opportunity to rehabilitate and revitalize the Hirschhorn Sculpture Garden for a 21st century function in a way that seeks to retain its historic character while addressing the museum's programming needs. Therefore, it is the Executive Director's recommendation that the Commission supports the Smithsonian's intention to revitalize the garden to improve the visitor experience and public engagement and accommodate the museum's mission and contemporary programming needs, finds that the proponents of the revitalization can reinforce and improve the connections between the National Mall, the Sculpture Garden, and the museum, and finds that the revitalization must balance visitor experience, program needs, and historic preservation considerations. I've already covered the rest of the recommendations in my presentation, so I will conclude now. I would like to introduce Ann Trollbridge, uh, the Smithsonian, and Melissa Chu, the director of the Hirschhorn Museum, who are here to convey some remarks to the commission, and will also help answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, as Ms. Uh, Trowbridge and Ms. Chu come up, uh, I'd like to also just mention we received uh, a letter from Ms. Nancy Slade uh, uh, commenting on uh, the Collins landscape design. Welcome Ms. back, Ms. Trowbridge. Uh, thank you, Mr. Webb, and uh, good afternoon again, Chairman Gallus and members of the Commission. We are very pleased to be moving forward with this wonderful project that will contribute very significantly to the revitalization of the Hirschhorn as the Smithsonian's premier museum for modern and contemporary art on the National Mall. Uh, our next steps in public uh, outreach include an open house for consulting parties, including NCPC, uh, to observe mock-ups of stacked stone wall options in early August. Uh, we are planning our next consulting party meeting in September. At that meeting, we will discuss further investigation into reevaluating the contributing elements to the sculpture garden as we begin an assessment on historic resources, uh, assessment of effects on historic resources as part of the Section 106 process. We have also invited the Cultural Landscape Foundation <clears throat> to meet with us to discuss research they are conducting and we'll include Lee Webb in that discussion. Our team is here today to answer your questions. I now have the great pleasure to introduce Melissa Chu, the Hirshhorn's director, to speak to the museum's goals for the project. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anne. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, we're very excited about this plan, primarily because it's mission-driven, that this, really, this whole process came about because we wanted to fulfill our mission 
of presenting modern and contemporary art, art of the 20th and 21st century. And we feel like this site of our sculpture garden by, through this new concept design, allows us to link our two campuses from the National Mall right through to the building. I had some other things to say about this project, but mostly that our founding mission uh, that, uh, and our founding collection that's mostly 20th century through this new concept design that really allows us to show it at its best. It's, uh, we have wonderful national treasures uh, by artists like Rodin, Giacometti, Matisse, and Barbara Hepworth. And through this design, we're creating really intimate viewing circumstances to really appreciate these national treasures. We also know that art of the 21st century has really changed. When we were created over 40 years ago, art was mostly human scale and certainly sculpture was more domestically scaled. And so this new concept design allows us to show some of the work that today has gotten so much larger in scale, sometimes even gigantic. And so with the opening up of the sculpture garden, especially in the West Gallery, we're able to accommodate some of that work. And the Central Gallery, we would very much like to focus some of our efforts on showing performance art. We recently started to acquire performance art. We have some on display at the museum right now. And we would like to have a dedicated space in the garden to really ensure that the garden is seen as an extension of the museum's program, <coughs> not a static space. I mentioned before that the concept really emphasizes this connection to the larger museum campus and its urban context. And I think that this is a really important thing that we've achieved through the overlooks and new entrances. And finally, I think it's this renovation that's necessary to fulfill the mission of the Hirshhorn. And its timing is critical. The Hirshhorn is the nation's museum of modern and contemporary art, and so we have a duty to serve all of our audiences. The garden renovations are vital to improve the visitor experience and to make them more universally accessible. And we talked a little bit about the um, accessibility, the change to the accessibility from Jefferson, which I think is a really important one because right now um, visitors are finding it difficult to get access. They need to go directly onto the National Mall to do that. We, we want to create the right setting for our collection as it continues to grow and evolve and to provide the critical infrastructure repairs, such as replacing the perimeter walls, amongst other things. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Chu and Ms. Trowbridge. Um, oh, on. Thank you. Um, let's open up for discussion. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Right. Commissioner Wright. <clears throat> um, I, I really like this plan. Um, I like almost everything about it. Um, and what I, what I don't, what I can't quite get there with is the stack stone, and, but not for the reasons that other people seem to have a problem with it. It's not about period of significance or preservation issues. It's more about <coughs> exhibit design. Um, and I can't help but think about, uh, if I think about um, installing a monumental piece with the stack stone as a backdrop, <clears throat> um, well, let me back up. Because I understand, I think I understand the design impetus for it because <laughs> there are more rooms in the garden and it's a more complex, almost interior design in a way. There are more walls, uh, it feels like. And, and, um, and I understand the idea of, 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 of providing some variety because uh, uh, it, would, it could potentially start to feel rather maze-like. <laughs> bless you. Um, bless you. Bless you. But... <laughs> 
I think about the stack stone as a backdrop as I would think for, for a, a work, as I would think about sort of a shiny wallpaper or a crinkly wallpaper in a, in a gallery for paintings, and, you, and one would never do that. Because it, it so in short, I, 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 it just, I, I, maybe it needs to be stone, or may, I, it needs to be varied from the smooth concrete, but does it need to be so busy as the backdrop for, um, I get it, you wouldn't notice it so much for a Henry Moore, but you would notice it for a Rodin, possibly, or a, a piece that has more texture. So I would just urge that there's a diff there may be some other ways to, to vary the interior room or the exterior rooms that are being created. Um, I'm sure you're going to hear plenty from the historic preservation community about, um, about the stack stone and probably already have, but that's not my reason. And, and I just wonder if there isn't a, another way to <coughs> provide variety without without so much texture that it might um, be distracting. And that's it for do, me. Do others want to come in on that particular issue before we go to other? Yeah, Commissioner May. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I saw the presentation of this at the Commission of Fine Arts, and I thought that the totality of that pres presentation was fairly compelling when it came to the, the, these additional walls. Um, but it, it, it did kind of stick with me in the comments that we'd seen and, of course, reading the report here. Uh, and then looking at the model, uh, where it really does come off as very busy. And it's not just, for me, it's not just about the sort of the busyness of the, and the, of the backdrop, but the, 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 the sort of total enclosure that occurs in some locations. And I feel like it's... Um, <coughs> There's, there's just maybe too much wall. Um, but I agree it's too busy, but it feels like there's, there's actually too much length of wall, and some of it's kind of oppressively high. Now, I mean, I think some of this is going to get worked out in the further discussions with the Commission of Fine Arts uh, and in, you know, in, in the other, you know, the Section 106 conversations or whatever else has to happen. Um, that's, those are my thoughts on the wall. Other comments on the wall features? Commissioner White. I would just concur with both comments. And I think when you picture yourself in there, and it feels a little overwhelming. And um, like I'm in Maine somewhere. It just, it just, <laughs> I know, it was a little jarring to me. And seeing it in, in model, it, not, not so bad, but Been not. Been saying, what's wrong with that? <laughs> but not, it's, to me, it's not the Hirschhorn, I guess. I mean, so I think just some tweaking would be helpful to see what they come back with. I have one uh, comment about, in particular, the the wall that is, I guess, called the new stone partition wall. Mm -hmm. I, I'm that one of all is the one that is uh, hanging me up. Uh, I'm trying to understand its purpose. I heard something in the presentation about the need to amplify a backdrop for performance art, I think is what I heard. I'm not buying that. I, I feel as though it will uh, really change the character of uh, really that view from, from the garden uh, up, you know, up to the museum itself, uh, the, the indoor museum. And um, so I, I really would like to have a little bit more feedback on what, why that particular wall needs to even be introduced. <coughs> which um, which particular on section Melissa wall? Yeah. To, to talk about, um, are you talking about the new <laughs> yeah. wall? At the underground passage? No, no, I'm talking about the. If you want to go back to 44, it's the it's it's new what's stone called partition. new stone partition wall. And I and I don't know if that's the blue one or the red one. 
like that's actually the bun shaft. It's, it's the replacing. blue one is the The new blue, it, so I'm talking about the blue one. That yes. is the backdrop to the, the, uh, the, the reflecting pool. Certainly. Thank you. Um, I might just, should I point it out, please? Sir, you might want to grab a mic so we can, can you, there's a handheld mic there. Okay, so, um, so you're referring now to this, yes? Yes. Yeah. So um, what I would say to that is that um, it was very much a part of Sugimoto's thinking to create a hierarchy between the walls. That in fact the hierarchy would be that all of the bun shaft or in kind walls that are being replaced um, would all be higher. Uh, and so you can see that perhaps not so clearly but mostly these white perimeter walls. But this, even though this is a new wall, this is actually much higher than this Sugimoto wall and that was intentional. I think that the way that we're thinking of the stone walls that Sugimoto has kind of developed something of an expertise right now because he's been doing these stone walls in a number of different architectural projects, especially in Japan, is that um, they're like his curatorial intervention, if you like. They're, it's a little bit like what you were saying in that he's thinking of these walls in terms of being backdrops for art and performance. So your um, summary was correct in that here we have um, platforms for both sculptures and also the stage for performance and that this is considered something of a backdrop for those. That he's, cr he's also trying to create some level of continuity in his intervention in that you have a wall here with the increased accessibility axis, you have this here, and then more of a focus on his, um, if you like, his curatorial walls that are backdrops then for our modern sculptures, mostly of bronze, and a kind of, um, uh, and a more, they're more intimate spaces because they're more domestic scaled, human scaled sculpture. So in some ways he's using this wall to link the two spaces visually <laughs> because you have this here, this defining, and then that, and then that. So it's kind of more of a, a visual approach. So, so my, my reaction simply is that while the other walls seem to have a purpose, this one doesn't seem to have the same need or purpose and has the biggest impact on the visual connection between the sunken garden and and the, the indoor museum. So, please just pass that along in terms of our our question or concern. Okay, let's. Any other comments on the wall? Okay, are we ready to move to other aspects of the plan, Commissioner Cash? Well, it's, it's a it's a new aspect. But I will just say maybe we can take that old air and space wall, which is flat but not too flat, and create the new uh, the new rooms with that. <laughs> uh, but so I guess I've I've become a cynic when it comes to water features, and I blame that on Pershing Park. I blame that on <laughs> on Freedom Plaza. But I always get nervous now when I see these big new water features because I just I feel like I've been burned too many times that they won't be there. And if this is going to be empty all the time, I think it really does a disservice to the space, especially if we're taking out green space because that area in there is already so hot in the summer, and it's I mean I don't want to say brutalist because I wouldn't I'm, I mean, I'm not an art critic or anything, but I mean it's it's not what's supposed to be. But I think if and seeing some of the renderings, what it looks like when those are empty, if it's going to be year-round, I just really worry if we're going to greatly expand a water feature that's going to be empty all the time. And think about maybe looking at preserving that the relation of the windows to one of those pieces of the water feature and maybe retaining some of the grass, and that can be a performance space. You can always put risers on it instead of draining something. So I guess I've just become a cynic like with bollards and, and antennas that I just always get very nervous about. <laughs> Whenever I see a water feature now, I think of the side of air and space and I think of, of Pershing Park and I, I just get really worried that, that if unless it's going to be really high priority to be maintained, um, I, I just get nervous about that. But I also want to also thank the Smithsonian for providing pencil drawings for a concept review rather than very, very detailed renderings, which uh, have gotten us in trouble and, and in some knots before. So, um, But I, I, I overall think that, that it's, it's a great improvement um, to, to what's a great space, but I would just uh, uh, ask you to, to really think about the, the water features and, and if that's really sustainable over the long term. Mr. Ginsburg? Yes. 
I know that, uh, I think this is lovely, I, I think one of the questions that I have is that at the introduction we talked about making this more accessible, and I didn't see anything in the proposal that actually makes the access better for those with disabilities, so I'd just love to hear a little bit more about how this makes it more accessible. Should I? Uh, it makes it, right now, uh, the accessibility from the museum side to the south of Jefferson Drive. If you were at the museum and wanted to visit the sculpture garden, you would need to walk on the path along the upper side of the mall around to across gravel in your wheelchair uh, or on your crutches or with your baby carriage and then go down one of the ramps to left to right of the center uh, of the north side of the sculpture garden. The improvement we're proposing, there is a ramp down to the middle of the west side from the mall as well as one down to the middle of the west side from Jefferson sidewalk. Uh, and then a ramp down, continuing down towards Jefferson on one side and a small flight of stairs on the other. So it's much more convenient for someone who wants to visit both the museum and the sculpture garden uh, to use this. Um, is it possible to bring up the, there was a, another drawing that showed the actual ramps in plan. Well, yeah, no. There we go, stop. <laughs> one more, <laughs> one, one more back. back. There we go. Yeah. So we, we see here with all those the ramps are shown with the diagonal lines crossing them, so that way we can see. And as it is right now, the only way to get access would be to go all the way around to that side. So now you can cross Jefferson and go down that series of ramps. Okay. Okay. Other comments about. Uh, accessibility or anything else related to this, Commissioner May. Um, just a couple of quick things. Um, uh, you know, I think that the uh, report uh, recommends for the coordination with the Park Service about Jefferson uh, Drive, and that's yeah. important to us. I think also, um, can you go to the image at the very end? So, um, Lighting. Well, no, actually, go back, go back, and just show the, the landscape plan. So I'm curious. Oh, stop right there. We go. So um, the the flowering trees that are shown on the northern side there. I mean, are do those relate to what's existing? Is that a continuation of what's existing, or is that something that's new? I couldn't tell from. I couldn't remember, and I couldn't tell from what. Let I me see. introduce Faye Harwell, our landscape architect for the project, yeah. to talk about the trees. Good afternoon. Uh, very happy to be here and answer the question. Uh, there is a grouping, a sort of sporadic grouping of flowering trees along that edge right now um, in various stages of condition and age. And the idea is to um, lighten the character of the plantings along that edge slightly um, since the focus on the mall in that area is um, statuesque and uh, sort of the sentinel trees of the, of the mall, the uh, elms that are on both the east and the west side um, of the garden. And also um, the emphasis is on shade within the garden and there, there have been uh, issues and questions raised from actually the Commission of, of Fine Arts to make sure that we um, make um, every effort to keep shade um, a priority for the garden in the lower area. So the idea was that we would have something lighter, a little bit more delicate, and something that suggests that there is an entrance to the museum up at that edge. So we have selected flowering cherries, um, both compatible with what's there now, but um, a new arrangement and species to be determined. I should say that with all of the tree selections, we are working very closely with Smithsonian Institution Gardens, um, and we haven't figured out all of the tree species at this moment. These are all preliminary. So have you so had comments welcome. Have, have you had discussions with the uh, um, with the National Park Service about that? Yes, as well. Okay. And they have, they have I mean I, I, I the reason I bring this up is that it just seems like it's a um, it's it, 
it's much more extensive in terms of the flowering trees there, and uh, I'm not totally convinced that that's consistent with what we would want. Now, again, I haven't been part of any of those discussions yeah. myself, um, but I would urge that there be more conversation with the staff of the National uh, Mall Memorial Parks um, because we don't really, I'm not sure that we're, we would be in line with something where it's, there's a lot more flowering trees in that section simply because the, you know, the look of the mall right now, when you look down the mall, it's the, it's the elms that oh, flank the, the, the lawn panels and to have something that, you know, at least for a few weeks out of the year is going to be different, bright and different. And the rest of the year isn't going to be that different mm -hmm. or it's going to be much smaller trees. I'm not sure that that's the right answer either. I don't know what the right answer is. I just think it's something that we have to discuss. Appreciate the comment. I think one of the things that we did talk about when we had one of the meetings with the, the Park Service team was um, the possibility of continuing the elms along that edge. And because we have them on the east and the west side of the garden, um, we felt that it would be a bit heavy to be down in the garden and have the elms so close to you up above your head and you'd be really experiencing the trunks more than the canopy. So more discussion is, is probably a good idea. We're taking that. Anything else That's on it. the plantings? Okay. Any other comments? I, Commissioner White. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you for providing a model that is just so helpful to understand how the space works. And notwithstanding my, my prior comments around the wall, I think this is really a very thoughtful approach to making that space work. And um, I really appreciate having the director here to hear the vision for what you want to achieve by making these changes to the sculpture garden. And, you know, in the um, previous discussion about the canal, it's really, it's really hard to take this space that means so much to people and make it work better because change is hard. But um, I think providing the shade is so critical to really having people enjoy it. So I'm, I'm sure you'll work out the, the uh, issues with the National Mall and the Park Service. But I just wanted to compliment you for the sensitivity and adding accessibility. And I think it'll be an extraordinary space. I had two quick questions. Uh, one about the, uh, the preferred alternative for the, uh, the, the stairway uh, and the lighting. Um, I understand why we want to make that a more inviting space. And uh, this one, that's good. Um, and so I guess, you know, is this the only way to do it? This is a kind of serious intervention. I really love the original stairwell opening. I think it's beautifully scaled. Uh, this is less lovely to me, but I do agree that having it without anyone wanting to go in it because it's too dark. So the question is, how much more um, of an extension is this? And is it going to have, how, are we convinced that it's going to have the effect <clears throat> we're, we're seeking since it's, we're still going to go into a tunnel underneath the road? Um, and so just curious what your thoughts are. Let me invite uh, Felix Ade of the Yun Architecture, uh, who is collaborating with Mr. Sugimoto on the design. Uh, I don't know if you have the sections through the um, we didn't stairway. Include those, okay. So. Uh, we had included some um, uh, cross sections in our submission booklet that might illustrate this. I don't know if we can call them up, but uh, we will definitely provide them in the next submission. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yeah, Felix, you're in architecture. Uh, the section would indeed be very helpful because what I'd like to point out is that this opening uh, widens to the north so much that the sun will actually now be able to clear the building, the top of the building, and bring sunlight all the way down to the bottom of the stair. Uh, that is sort of important for us to actually get that achievement where the light really comes down and hits the bottom. So when you come down, you see light uh, at the bottom of, of the mm. stair. And uh, that's why this opening is so wide. Mm. Commissioner Cash, did you have a question? 
Actually, on the stairs, so it was touched on in the uh, the EDR, I think, that it was originally closed due to safety concerns, but didn't really expand on that much. Could could you talk a little bit about, was it just because it was dark and people didn't use it? I mean, what was the, the safety concern? Uh, it was dark. It was occupied by uh, people and uh, visitors uh, did not want to go in there. It was a maintenance problem for various reasons. It, it was closed. But the, the darkness was a contributing factor to that. It is currently in uh, the stairs still there behind walls and, and covered plaza, and the, the space is used as the art lab, uh, which is an after school uh, program for teenagers. So, what's going to be changed other than more light this time that you think will avoid? The, the dangerous feeling. Well, we've we've introduced an intervening um, art piece in the curved infinity walls that will be of a um, textured stainless steel material, and that will further, I think, reflect light and give give the space more um, a reason for people to go in it and be and use it more. I think so. Uh, we think it'll be quite, quite improved, but light is important to that. And also, so what's going to happen with the art lab space? Is that being contemplated? Is it going to be something that Smithsonian just tries to move somewhere an, else? We have another project uh, beginning work on an interior renovation study that would uh, relocate that to a part of the museum that's now the galleries near the auditorium in the basement level. Thank you. Commissioner Gallus, if you have your EDR, starting on 64, we did include the sections within the EDR attachment to the, the report. So for the preferred, yeah. it would be page 65. <clears throat> no, I think hearing the explanation of the sun angle passing, you know, uh, uh, with, you know, with the building uh, not a, not blocking it, most of the part of the day is a brilliant uh, intervention, I would say, and one that is really needed to make that connection. Because if you're on the Hirshhorn side and you want to cross over, it's kind of prohibitive today. It's really not an inviting thing to do. So I'm, I'm really welcoming the intervention. My other uh, comment has to do with the reflecting pool, option alternative four. Um, you know, I didn't want to like any of these because uh, I, I think the scale of the reflecting pool as it was was pretty much perfect. Um, I, I do, uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, um, attracted to though the notion of making the pool uh, be part of an active element in the space, even though I don't like that wall behind it. Um, but uh, alternative four uh, seems to get it just right to me in terms of understanding how we can both respect that dimensional sort of aspect of connecting back to the interior uh, window uh, in, the, in, the, in the indoor museum. And uh, so I just wanted to compliment that choice. Okay. Um, any other comments? Okay. So, can we have a motion to approve the comments on the concept design? So moved. And second. second. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank, thank you. you for the unanimous. Thank you very much for your input. Good luck. We look forward to hearing the next phase of this. Okay. We're sorry to see the model go. It's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Come back anytime. Um, the final open session item is uh, the Commission's preliminary review of the Uniform Services, University of Health Sciences, Education, and Research Building, submitted by the Department of the Navy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gerbich, for your presentation on this.
it is. All right. I think we got the technical glitch worked out over here. I know some folks are still looking at the model. <laughs> Please proceed. Of course. All right. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the commission. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense Department of the Navy has submitted revised preliminary site and building plans for a new education and research building for the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, or USUHS, at the Naval Support Activity Bethesda in Bethesda, Maryland. As you may recall, the commission reviewed the concept design and provided comments at its June 2018 meeting and reviewed and approved a preliminary design in September 2018. This revised preliminary submission is intended to respond to commission concerns and previous reviews, which will be the focus of this presentation. So the education and research building is proposed at the eastern end of the NSA Bethesda campus in Montgomery County, which sits adjacent to the Capitol Beltway and lies directly to the east of the National Institutes of Health campus. The location of the proposed building is highlighted here with a yellow circle. Uh, the location of the building can be seen here in relation to the larger campus transportation network. Um, you can also see the Medical Center Metro Rail Station to the west, which is located across Rockville Pike. Access is provided to the proposed building via campus shuttle, which is shown here with a gray line, pedestrian routes, which are shown in blue, and automobile, which is shown in green. As can be seen, primary building access via most travel modes would occur along South Palmer Road. Uh, the map on this slide shows a detail of the proposed location for the Education and Research Building, along with existing buildings and facilities in the area. To the west is the Armed Forces Radio Biology Research Institute, or AFRI, and the remainder of the USU campus sits to the east. To the north and south of the proposed location are natural areas with mature trees and walking trails. Um, as noted here with red shading, two buildings on the university campus would be demolished to accommodate the new building as would an existing surface parking lot. This slide shows the overall site plan for the project with the proposed building outlined in yellow and how it would integrate with the University and Research Institute campuses. Uh, the proposed building is intended to interface with both campuses with laboratory spaces on the west that connect to lab spaces at AFRI and offices to the east that are accessible to the USU campus. Before I get into detail regarding previous commission comments, I first want to review a couple important changes that have influenced the building design in the submission. Um, as you may recall, in previous iterations, a bridge connection was proposed to link the new building with the adjacent AFRI building to the west, which is highlighted here with a yellow circle. This one-story connection was intended to transport materials between the laboratory spaces. Um, in the updated design, which is shown here, this connector has been expanded to two stories, which will allow it to accommodate the safe and efficient transport of both materials and pedestrians. Uh, the other major design decision is the elimination of a three-story bridge connector that was initially proposed between the new building and building 70 and 71 of the USU campus, which can be seen on the right side of this image. The applicant has indicated that a direct connection between these buildings is no longer required to meet programmatic needs. The updated rendering can be seen here with this connection removed, which the applicant has noted also serves to open up the plaza. 
A two-story bridge connection has been retained to Building 70, as can be seen at the far right of the image. I next want to review applicant responses to specific commission concerns. Can you back up? Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that, that goes away. So this whole thing, goes away. What, and what's the F in doing? It, it was in the rendering. Oh, so. okay. So, all right. So can you just? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry to interrupt. No, you're fine. And you'll get a better view of this as we yeah. go with some aerial views. <laughs> Um, okay, so again, I, I next want to review some specific uh, responses to commission concerns, the first of which uh, relates to the amount of landscaping here on the Eastern Plaza. Um, so this is the preliminary design from September 2018. So in its uh, previous review, the commission expressed concerns with the large amount of hardscaping and lack of vegetation and tree cover for shade. So at that time, the applicant indicated that the plaza uh, sits on top of a proposed radiobiology facility, which restricts planter depth and tree heights. The applicant has since clarified that the amount of vegetation on the plaza is further restricted by emergency vehicle access and anti-terrorism force protection requirements, um, and that more broadly, the location of underground utilities and bioretention facilities further restrict vegetation across the project area. So the applicant has provided a revised landscape plan, which can be seen here, um, with the emergency vehicle access on the eastern plaza shown in red. Given the identified challenges, the applicant has replaced a proposed planter bed on the plaza with five additional tree planters, which are identified here with orange circles. Um, they've also proposed additional tree planters on the western plaza, which is actually here at the top of the slide. Um, an updated rendering of the eastern plaza can be seen here. Uh, the applicant has indicated that this is the extent of landscaping that can be provided given the existing site constraints. Uh, while staff appreciates the effort to break up the hardscape to the extent practicable, we generally find that the proposed trees on the plaza would still not provide adequate shade relief. Um, if further landscaping cannot be provided, staff requests that the applicant consider the use of tables, chairs, and either built-in or non-permanent shade structures to provide further seating and shade relief on the plaza. Um, the next set of commission concerns relate specifically to elements of the building design, um, including solar exposure on the western facade. So as you may recall, in previous reviews, the commission expressed concerns regarding the likely amount of heat and daylight that would filter into the laboratory spaces in the afternoon sun. While the applicant provided clarification that the glazing system would consist of transparent glass interspersed with spandrel panels to reduce infiltration of sunlight, the commission continued to question the appropriateness of the design decision, asking whether the applicant could reorient the building to reduce solar exposure. The applicant has continued to emphasize the importance of natural daylight in the laboratory spaces, which can only be achieved on the western facade due to existing buildings to the east. Further, the building orientation is also dictated by the building program, which requires that the lab spaces are directly accessible to the AFRI lab building to the west, and that the offices are accessible to the USU campus to the east, as is demonstrated here. Um, the applicant has not made major design changes to this western facade, but has provided additional information regarding solar performance, specifically noting that the glazing system has been extensively evaluated and that it exceeds solar, um, solar heat gain performance criteria. The analysis indicates that the glare would be mitigated with internal roller shades and that the building would still maintain good thermal comfort performance. Um, the last major area of concern related to building access from the northwest stairs, which is shown here in the current design. In previous reviews, the commission raised issues with the overall back of house feel at this location, as well as the number of stairs required to access the western terrace, uh, specifically requesting that the applicant sit, consider adding ground level building access at this location. The applicant has not made major design changes here, but has noted that the multi-story stair at this location functions primarily as building egress, and that um, building access from here would be minimal because of the existing pedestrian network, which generally directs pedestrians through the eastern plaza. Um, most building access that occurs from the northwest would be from the relatively few on-street parking spaces along the adjacent roadway here. Regarding ground level access as an alternative to the stairs, the applicant has indicated that direct building access cannot be provided near the stairs because this space contains mechanical equipment that serves the laboratory spaces. 
Ground level access, however, will be accommodated through an elevator in the adjacent parking garage, um, which is just a short trip past the loading zone, uh, which is marked here with the pink circle. Um, this is the extent of changes and clarification provided by the applicant, though they are available to answer any further questions uh, the Commission may have about the project and building program. Okay. Um, so I've reviewed a lot of these recommendations kind of, um, and moving through the presentation, but just a few things I'd like to point out. Um, the, um, in conclusion, um, it is the Executive Director's recommendation, recommendation that the Commission approves the revised preliminary site and building plans for the Education and Research Building at NSA Bethesda. Uh, regarding landscaping, the Commission requests that the applicant consider the use of tables, chairs, and either built-in or non-permanent shade structures to provide further seating and shade relief on the Eastern Plaza. Um, and finally, notes, uh, the Commission notes that the applicant will submit site and building plans for final review upon completion of environmental and historic preservation compliance. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. As noted, members of the project team are here to answer any questions about the project. Um, though before you begin your discussion, Commander Carlton Dodson, the MILCON Program Manager and Defense Health Agency Facilities Region Director would like to briefly address the Commission. Thank you. Welcome, Commander Dodson. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Webb and Commissioners. Uh, before I uh, start, I want to, on behalf of the leadership at the Defense Health Agency and uh, the Uniformed Services University, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak to you in regards to this project, as well as uh, having uh, you be able to set aside your valuable time to uh, provide your subject matter expertise in regards to the planning and development of uh, the uh, federal uh, facilities and infrastructures that's here in the National Capital Region. Um, I was planning to uh, do a, a hour and a half brief, knowing it was going to be a ha uh, the last presentation. But I did that mainly because uh, I was thinking about uh, the rush hour traffic, trying to get out of it. Out of it. But, um, I know that a lot of you are tired, so we're going to go ahead and uh, I'll try to make this brief as possible. Um, we are very excited today to present and discuss our latest design. Uh, developments for this new medical military construction project to enhance our military health system capabilities. The University Service University was originally built on the foundation of academic and scientific excellence. Selection of students and faculty would reflect this posture. To bring in the best of the best, it is critical to have the latest and greatest technologies and infrastructure necessary to draw interest. Therefore, buildings do matter, not just for providing state-of-art capabilities, but also having a modern look and feel that can span through the 21st century. <laughs> Building infrastructure sends messages whether they are perceived or actual. In this case, image portrays university quality. The military health system exists in a very competitive medical school market for students, faculty, research scientists, technicians, leaders and administrative personnel. Exit interviews with prospective students reference outdated appearances and capabilities of the campus. As a result, the decision to use glass facade as, an extensively, as extensively as we did and in such a viable location, visible location, was quite deliberate made by the president of the university, the dean of the medical school, and the director of research after soliciting input from various staff and students that are currently attending. Both uh, President Thomas and Dean Kellerman believe that the glass facade will help blend the campus buildings in AFRI together and provide a more forward-looking campus that will better position the university in the competitive recruitment of top quality students and recruitment and retention of world-class faculty. The glass facade also provides significantly more natural light into work areas and lab spaces, which is considerably particularly important because of the large footprint in the overall purpose of the building. We as the military health system, as specifically the Defense Health Agency and the Unified Uniform Services University, are very pleased with the current design solution as it follows DOD medical world-class standards. With its balanced facade treatments and material articulation, the new design makes its own statement as an inviting education and research laboratory center 
as we move further along in the 21st century while keeping with the installation design guide and the base master plan. The new design creates an appealing building that promotes efficiency in design and construction, establishing a desirable learning and research environment for faculty, students, patients, and other staff. <coughs> the exterior design concept works to celebrate the creative process, process of how ideas take flight and develop. As a medical education and research facility, it helps amplify the notion of being more open with creativity and helps with bringing the much needed daylight deep into the laboratory spaces. We must be able to successfully com compete with the best medical institutions in the nation in order to attract the best talent, to serve as care providers, and to create medical solutions for our nation's sons, daughters who fight for our freedoms, our veterans, and for our nation's population. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Commander Dodson. Uh, I think I'm going to start since you spoke, you were speaking directly to me in many ways because <laughs> my comments were particularly pointed at the glass facade. So I'd like to just uh, have a little bit of uh, exchange if you don't mind. Uh, I, I'm particularly moved by the seeking the best and brightest. I think that's what we want for our uniformed services. And that would be the last thing I would want to do is inhibit that kind of Thing. Uh, having a building that attracts the best and the brightest is something all of us as Americans would want to have for your mission. Um, there are many ways to do beautiful buildings. Glass is one of them. Um, I think that um, I, I think that uh, we've fallen in love with the glass facade. It's a beautiful facade, frankly. I think it's uh, quite nice and I think it will achieve your goal of attracting people who are interested in uh, state of the art. The thing that I recall um, and I was you know I, 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 some of my memories getting a little less good over my years as I advance but one of the things that I remember about the original presentation was there was a photograph of us looking from inside the lab, looking at the, it was showing how the blinds were pulled, okay? And what that showed me was, geez, we really don't want all that light in the lab. Now, I, I hear that it sounds like we need light deep into the lab, and I, I heard your comment. But it, it does belie the original presentation, which showed almost exactly the opposite of that point. So I was responding to seeing a photograph of a lab space from the inside with the shades drawn, really unattractive in terms of what that space would be. And it, it said to me that really don't want direct western sun, which is going to be very intense, coming into this space. Um, I, I appreciate the, you know, the work to study the glazing system and, and all of that, but um, I, do, I do want to be clear, too, that my comments weren't about asking you to reprogram the building and move the lab space to the other side. That's, that's up to you. I think the adjacencies are really obviously important, and I respect those. Okay, I think it's really about the choice of what do you need and I, I do appreciate that you've commented on you need that deep light into the space uh, which again belies the original presentation um, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost I want to say I, I want to be convinced but I, I hope you know what you're asking for when you when you get what you get here because <laughs> the Sun is going to be intense and um, uh, to, to show me now a diagram that says, oh, it's only 50%. I think I understood the spandrel design uh, when I saw it the first time. And it's, like I said, very attractive. But uh, only 50% is really, I, I'm, not, I'm not sold. But I, you know, I just wanted you to hear my comments. Commissioner Wright. 
Well, <laughs> I'm not happy either. And I don't think you've been responsive to the comments. I don't believe, frankly, uh, that 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 the that you have no options for the plaza. Um, in terms of the, I, I I I understand the engineering and all of that, but you have the possibility, if nothing else, if you have no options to create shade, then it defies logic that you would adhere to you know the this vast hardscape. I mean, no one in their right mind is going to want to be out there. So if what you're trying to do is get people to hustle into the building, this design accomplishes that <laughs> because nobody's going to want to be there. So here's an alternative suggestion. Get rid of 30% of the hardscape and put in grass panels because at least you won't be creating a heat island that will be... Um, that will rip, that will completely repel people. Um, you can't. I get it. If you can't, if you if if you can't, if it can't carry the weight of, of of trees to provide shade, then reduce the hardscape. What's the point in having it if nobody wants to be out there? And it'll be cheaper, and you'll save money. I, I it, it feels a little. I have to say, you're, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I think that people in the military deserve the finest of the fine because they don't have to do what they're doing. And, and I, it, it, I'm, I'm almost always disappointed in the submissions that come through here because we say that on the one hand, but we don't seem to do it. We, we seem to, to make choices that result in poor quality design over and over and over again. And that's, I'm not talking to the Navy and you specifically right now. I'm just thinking about all of the installations that we've looked at that look like, you know, big box stores. And it's just disappointing. You might as well just, you know, buy a building that, that comes out of a box and you put the parts together. Can we go back and look at the back of house piece again? I, I just, I give up on this. I just, I, 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 I give up, but, but you better hope a lot of people aren't coming in this way because they sure as hell won't want to. And it could have been fixed with design, but it just looks like people don't want to. And so I, I wave the white flag. I wish that this had stayed on the consent calendar because it's just made me mad. And, and, and I just think that we owe people especially people who are in service to this country better than this. And I'm finished ranting now. So uh, I have to agree with pretty much everything that's been said so far. I mean, I had concerns about this design. Um, I do actually have a question. If we can go back to the plaza for a sec. So explain to me again, we need, this needs to be plaza um, because of vehicular access needs? So the plaza is related to the, there's a facility under, underneath this. Yes. Um, the emergency access is actually highlighted here. So it's basically just saying that this area that's highlighted in red has to be clear for emergency vehicle access. That's what that was referring to. Okay, so where is that red on the... On the, on the image that you just showed us, it's running right where the, the pedestrian's walking. So. Okay, and how so, how so wide is that, not? by the way? How wide is that? I don't know offhand. I might ask someone from the design team to. That's all right. Uh, yeah, uh, it's actually twenty feet wide, and it's um, I think one important factor with when we talk about fire lanes is that it's unobstructed. Um, it's got to be somewhat uh, um, hard. Obviously, there are um, other solutions there, but this made the most sense for this particular um, design. I think the key, though, is unobstructed. All right, so let, let me ask you a question. You can, you can sit down, Jim. Oh, excuse me, me. Could you identify yourself, please? Sorry. Thank I'm you. I'm John Seeley. I'm an architect with HKS. Okay. Well, and, and maybe you'll need to come back again, but I don't know. But 
So what you're telling us, though, is that we need to have emergency access to drive fire trucks through here in a 20-foot wide space, but it's not strong enough to hold up a tree. I find that hard to believe. I mean, I'm not a structural engineer, um, but I find it hard to believe that it's not po that we have to have these tiny little trees here in this space, but we're going to drive fire trucks down the middle of that. Uh, it just does not make any sense to me. So, um, and I, I, I agree with Commissioner Wright that at the very least, some of this should be taken out and put in and grass should be put in wherever it can be. And I'm not suggesting that that should be where the fire lane is. A 20-foot wide paved area is perfectly fine. What we have here is 50 feet wide, and it's all hard, and there's no shade. So I also think shade structures of some sort would be important. And I think all of this is in support of the statement that we first heard about making this a superior facility that attracts the best and the brightest. I, I mean, this is not, it, it, you know, the building may be perfectly fine, but how you get to it is is going to be a, an awful experience. And I don't think you want that. So I, I don't know what more to say. We're, we've said it three times over now. So, um, and I agree on the, you know, the, the, the back side of the building, I give up on that too. <laughs> It, it is astounding to me that we could talk about the same thing three times over and it doesn't change, it doesn't get any better. And it could, and it's not that hard. So, um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dixon. I just want information. Are these trees going to grow more? Maybe these are small trees no. in your diagram. They won't They're go any bigger. They won't take the way. That's the answer I get. Oh, I see. That's the answer. Oh. I didn't. But maybe please, speak. please tell us who you are. Calvin Austin, I'm design manager for NAFAC Washington, but I'm also a structural engineer, so I figured I'd jump in at this time. Because, can I go to the? Uh, uh, we, the you'd have to take the mic oh, with. You. Please take. Talk, explain some of this. Not, not everything in the landscape area has offices below, so there are areas where we could possibly get some trees. Some of this is, this is a portion of this that has lies below, but there's some portions that are slab on. Um, um, sorry, ground underneath it, so we could have some, but we also have utilities that run through that area as well, too. Um, one thing that's not noted on this is we have a lot of utilities running all over the place in this area, and we're trying to add more, and that also restricts some of our tree placement areas, but there is portions that, uh, that are not have offices below it that we could possibly put some trees in in those areas, but they're very small strips a slab on grade. So just wanted to say that as a structural engineer. Mr. Cash. Did I hear Mr. Gerbich correctly in saying that part of the problem here with not having more trees was bioretention as well? So they've indicated not so much on the plaza, but okay. in the landscape. I know there are some issues that are areas that are intended to retain water for bioretention purposes. And while they had initially proposed some landscaping in those locations, I think they had concerns with kind of the long term sustainability of, of plantings in those areas. Well, I guess I've, the first thing I'd say just on that note is that even if it's bioretention not here, the plaza seems like a very contributing factor for the need for bioretention. So I think that, that when I heard that, I, I kind of had to do a double take. But I just want to kind of echo a lot of the comments I've heard here, too. I mean, the back side of the building and that staircase was what I thought was the most awful part of, of the whole thing last time. And one of the things I love about being on the commission is seeing how these plans evolve. After they come to us, we put our comments in and we see a new iteration of it. And I have to agree, especially with these DOD projects, but this one in particular, we don't get any new design. We get double the pushback. And yeah. maybe if we're getting to the point where we have that much design problem and the team says that they just can't work with any of the suggestions, that maybe it's time to go back to the drawing board and come up with a design that actually addresses some of the concerns and not just dig in on this. So I'm really disappointed by by the lack of progress on this. I, I, I mean, maybe the, the only saving grace is that 0.5% of the population will ever actually be in this <laughs> campus to see it or have to walk up those stairs. But I, I'd also like to say that, that being now the one of the DC people here on, on this panel, if 
the Department of General Services were to push back on NCPC or a federal agency the way that we're getting pushed back with all of our recommendations, we'd have a congressional appropriations rider in a year telling us not to build the thing because it's a bad idea. So um, institutionally, I think it's just it's, it's a little bit disappointing the same way that we get parking minimums when we talk about Pentagon and everything else. And I just think that, that I was a big advocate for, for this when we came to Pershing Park, that sometimes you just might need to step back and, and start over because we have a design that, that I don't think has really changed at all. And, and the plaza might have actually gotten worse. So um, sorry to kind of be a, a Debbie Downer. Maybe it's, it's getting towards dinner time. But uh, that's I, I just had to, to put that on the record from an institutional standpoint. Any other comments? <laughs> well, Commissioner, yes, yes please. Uh, so this is the first time I've seen this one. I've reviewed it, so I was not here when it first came in with with this one. But uh, but I think as as one of the gentlemen mentioned, uh, the, we should go back take a look at what we the trees. Mike is on. It stays on. All right. Thanks. Uh, that, that we need to go back and just take a look at what we could do with the plaza itself. Uh, so I think for the Navy team, I, I think we just have to take a look at that. So we'll, we'll do that. And I think the general comments about DOD projects, obviously, we'll, you know, we'll keep working with the commission. We'll keep working with uh, the CFA and just uh, make sure we are uh, we bring the appropriate uh, designs over here. Commissioner Sajil. Um, I'm, I'm sensing the room a little bit, and I, we haven't had a, a, a motion yet. Um, seems to me that the options are we can take a vote and see where we are. Um, we could defer uh, as you as you all your team goes back to look at this again. Um, and I'm wondering if you'd entertain. Maybe you want to consult with your team about. Uh, what we want to do here, but um, I'm concerned about uh, getting a motion of approval on this. So let me talk to the team and see what they <coughs> from the timelines. You want to take a, a short, right. uh, brief recess and, and step aside, please, step for a second? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Sajil. Uh, you have the floor. So thank you, uh, thank you for a few minutes. Thank you for giving us some time. Uh, I think what we would like to do is to uh, to defer it for a couple of months, whenever the next chance would be, so the design team will have a chance to go back and take a look at the two items which I uh, which I'm uh, watching as the issues that we need to work. One is the plaza landscaping piece. Uh, that to take a look at what other stuff could be done uh, for that. Uh, so I think the team is going to take a look at that, and then and then also take a look at the back stairs, you know, those being called back of the house, back. Uh, but basically to relook at that, to uh, because that's not really an entrance piece; it's it's, it's there in the back. Uh, so so I think team just needs to go back, take a look at that. So I think those, if we could have those two items, then we'll come back uh, in about a couple of months or whenever the schedule. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Um, all in favor of deferring uh, this item today, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good luck to all of us. We look forward to it. <laughs> Godspeed. Thank you. Uh, commission hearings adjourned. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you very much.